Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. First of all, um, I want to thank all of the sergeants at arms and uh, Carl D'Alba and the entire team for uh, moving us uh, back here into the chambers. Obviously, when libraries come to town, they come full force, and uh, that requires us to have a little bit more space, so I want to thank all of the, the team here for quickly um, uh, setting this up for us and getting us back here uh, for our hearing. So we don't clap in the chambers, but we, we raise our hands. So raise our hands for all of the sergeants in arms and all the staff members who have helped uh, put us together back here in chambers. Um, so my name is Jimmy Van Bramer. I'm proud to be the chair of Cultural Affairs and Libraries and uh, proud to uh, chair this, our hearing on the mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. And we are now in session. I want to thank um, all of you for being here, all of you who joined the rally and press conference uh, before to shout loud and clear and in unison that libraries are for everyone and we need to protect and defend our libraries. Uh, I want to thank our three library system heads and uh, all of you, the members of the library community. Also, just a note, because I see some folks in the audience are uh, here for the cultural affairs portion of this hearing that will follow this hearing. So um, you'll get to learn all you ever wanted to know about libraries while you await the second portion of this hearing, which will include Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl on the Department of Cultural Affairs budget. Uh, let me uh, recognize and thank uh, Council Member Karen Kozowitz from Queens, uh, who is a, a new member of our committee, but certainly not new to the City Council, and certainly not new to libraries and library issues. Um, and as I said earlier uh, today, I joined the staff of the Queens Library in January of 1999. And one of my duties uh, was to help craft the testimony for the then director of the Queen's Library, Gary Strong, in 1999. And so this preliminary budget hearing I would have attended in February, March of 1999. And that marks, this marks the 20th uh, year uh, that I will be involved in the budget process on behalf of libraries. and. Uh, I was thinking about that this morning and thinking about the fact that 20 years of my life have been devoted to protecting and defending our library, something I'm immensely proud of. Uh, it's become really my life's work, and, uh, and I'm thrilled to be a part of you and a part of this effort. Now, we know that libraries are essential. We know that they are vital. Uh, we know that as our values are under attack all across the country, that libraries and library workers are at the front lines of defending those values and making sure that every single New Yorker has a safe place uh, to, uh, uh, to congregate, uh, to learn, to strive, uh, and to simply be, really, because libraries provide that space for people to simply be. And I'm immensely proud that over the last several years, not only did we fight back uh, millions and millions of dollars in budget cuts, but we were also able to then restore uh, tens of millions of dollars to the library's budget and then achieve what we have worked for uh, for the 20 years that I've been involved in this effort, the baselining of six-day service. We've also seen record investment in the capital budget for libraries, and that too has been a very significant advancement. Uh, but that's not to say that we can rest on our laurels or that we should uh, stop there. Uh, the truth is that the capital needs for our three library systems are still immense and require immediate investment and attention. And of course, uh, we haven't increased the budget for libraries uh, in three years in a meaningful way. And we need to do that because not only do expenses increase, but the need for libraries has increased the desire for the information, the services, 
the programs has increased dramatically. And so uh, we uh, believe that libraries uh, can and should receive more uh, from the city government. And the council has always led the way. Uh, uh, literally for the last 20 years, the council has led the way in the fight for libraries and library services. So I'm thrilled to be a part of that effort along with council member Kozlowitz and the members of this committee and this council to fight for libraries. So with that, I want to uh, welcome the three uh, library presidents and CEOs, uh, Linda Johnson from the Brooklyn Public Library, Dennis Walcott from the Queens Library, and Tony Marks from the New York Public Library. And I know that uh, some uh, representatives from uh, the unions and the uh, DC 37 locals may be speaking later as well. So with that, I will ask Linda Johnson to begin the testimony on behalf of the library systems. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman uh, Koslowitz and members of the committee. Uh, Speaker Johnson, Majority Leader Cumbo, Finance Chair Drum, and Brooklyn Delegation and the City Council for supporting New York City's libraries. We deeply appreciate all you have done to ensure our libraries remain welcoming institutions, open to everyone nearly every day. We rely on your commitment to our libraries so we can help the many communities who depend on us. Your support has helped us reverse years of underfunding, but our job is far from finished. As well, thank you to all the library workers who came out to City Hall today, including our partners at DC 37 and Brooklyn's local 1482 and local president, Ron Barber. I'm certain you will appreciate their eloquent testimony. It's due, it is due in large part to our staff that libraries can be counted on as safe, welcoming spaces for all. This aspect of our mission has never been more important. We know that you and the City Council share this core value. Our doors are open wide to accommodate everyone from the New American Practicing English at a conversation group in Bay Ridge to the senior bowling with a virtual league in Bed-Stuy, from toddlers enjoying Saturday story time to the parents on Rikers Island reading to a child via teleconference to Coney Island Library. There is no question that public libraries are truly here for everyone. We need the city's increased support to fulfill this mission. Today, we submit our fiscal year 19 tri-library executive budget request, an increase of $16 million in operating funds to be split among the three library systems, coupled with an increase of 20 million in capital dollars for each library system. For Brooklyn Public Library, the 4.5 million we are requesting as an increase in expense dollars to provide the exceptional library service our patrons deserve. It is imperative that we maintain our physical spaces. We need funds to cover repairs and upkeep that are not capitally eligible and to invest in highly trained staff and up-to-date materials and collections. The cost of providing six-day service has increased, and it is all the more challenging to remain nimble and responsive to the changing needs of our patrons. Just last month, for example, our immigrant services team hosted its first legal clinic to help patrons renew Haitian temporary protective status, a benefit that the Trump administration has recently terminated. Every day, families who are facing uncertainty about immigration status in the United States turn to the library for free legal services and reliable information. In many cases, the library is the only institution they trust. You can also see what a difference six-day service has made by visiting one of our standing room only story time programs. We offer them every week in every library and in multiple languages as often as possible. Cortelu Library, for example, provides story time in English, Spanish, Urdu, and Russian every single week, and they are seeking ways to add Nepali to their repertoire. 
To sustain this incredible work, we must continue to support our staff and ensure our materials and collections budget, particularly in world languages, are increased to a level commensurate and expanded with expanded service. In a borough of 2.6 million, we should be spending at least $10 million on our collections, but we are not there yet. Brooklyn Public Library finds new and inventive ways to engage communities that might otherwise be isolated or overlooked. Our Services for Older Adults launched Senior Debate last week, which gathers seniors in the library for lively discussions about pressing issues and with, with their peers while learning and practicing the art of debate. Earlier, I mentioned that Brooklyn Public Library's popular virtual bowling league for senior citizens, Library Lanes, an incredibly popular program. It has 24 teams around the borough who compete virtually for the league trophy while making friends and becoming technologically adept. Technology at the library is the lifeline for all of our patrons, but children and teens in particular appreciate Brooklyn Public Library's new technology resources. Last year, BPL launched its first ever Brooklyn Robotics League. Young adults throughout the borough are invited to join one of a dozen teams to learn the value of teamwork and problem solving while building coding and progro programming robots. At the end of the eight-week program, we held a competition and judged their creations. This teen tech STEM program is in such high demand we expanded the league to all of our branches just last month. Our focus on teen engagement has grown stronger thanks to the library's Brooklyn Incubator, a process that supports innovative programming by providing mentorship and resources to library staff with creative new ideas. Book Match Teen, for example, is based on the premise that teen library services are most successful when they are spearheaded by the teens themselves. This series involves training participant in reader advisory group skills, including interviewing, writing book reviews, and crafting book lists. The popular Remix Academy is a six-week DJ and music production workshop for bed teens, culminating in a final pro product presented in a teen showcase. Likewise, Brown, Brownsville, excer <coughs> Brownsville Excerpts Teens Podcasting is a 10-week instructor-led program in partnership with Brownsville Community Justice Center, which builds broadcasting skills for young adults who record and edit their own podcasts about life in Brownsville. In these and so many other ways, Brooklyn Public Library has strengthened our commitment to community engagement which is the center of our recently completed strategic plan. We are determined to be responsive to the different needs of the neighborhoods our libraries serve and will continue to prioritize community input for all major capital projects over the next several years. Indeed, a cornerstone of our strategic plan is to provide inclusive and ins inspirational places. Providing a welcoming environment to our patrons is vital but so many of our libraries are plagued by maintenance issues, equipment failures, and drab, uninspiring interiors. We spend upwards of $1 million of our operating funds every year on infrastructure, upkeep that is not capitally eligible, maintaining old boilers, replacing dilapidated furniture, and funding temporary heating and cooling solutions while we wait for ca a capital project to replace non-working systems. These costly needs compete for our treasured operating dollars and ultimately steal funds from our criti critical programming needs. We are forced to spend limited operating dollars treating the symptoms of our capital crisis. Just a few years ago, Brooklyn Public Library carried $300 million in unfunded capital needs for the 59 libraries in our system. With the help of the city and our Brooklyn Council members, the state and Creative Capital Pro Projects partnerships, we have reduced the need to $240 million. 
you have helped BPL enter its most significant era of building in recent memory. Over the next five years, one third of Brooklyn Public Library system will have been rebuilt or renovated. While we are turning to the while we are turning the ship in the right direction, the bad news is that we still have $240 million in unmet capital needs system-wide. Approximately one-third of those needs are emergency infrastructure projects like boilers, HVAC systems, roofs, and security upgrades. We are facing a deferred maintenance crisis that still impacts many neighborhoods in the borough. We are not alone in this crisis. Together, our three library systems are requesting a total of $60 million in funding this year, $20 million for each system. For Brooklyn Public Library, this funding will address our most critical capital needs, including failing infrastructure and equipment that has long exceeded its useful life. While we have begun to make progress for libraries, our overall funding level continually forces us to triage only the most serious projects and leave the countless critical infrastructure needs and preventative work unaddressed. We spend much of our time and resources responding to emergencies. The lack of a reliable source of recurring funding also makes it impossible for us to manage capital projects efficiently. This is why the undercurrent of this year's request for $20 million each in capital, the request that we implore you to remember after this budget is finalized, is to push for library inclusion in next year's 10-year plan. At our present level of funding, we cannot perform necessary preventative maintenance. We cannot ensure that projects that encounter a shortfall can continue to move forward, and we cannot manage our program the largely city, uh, largely city owned buildings in the most holistic and efficient way possible. New York City's libraries are and always will be for everyone. We are a haven for immigrants, a provider of hope to the unemployed, a source of endless wonder for children, a place of discovery and learning for whoever has the inclination to walk through our doors. There has never been a better time for the city to stand with us and proclaim that everyone is welcome here. Help us fulfill our mission by supporting libraries and the people who need us most. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to you. My name is Dennis Walcott, and I'm the President and CEO of the Queens Library. And thank you, Linda, for outlining the challenges our three systems collectively face next year and how we can meet them. Uh, it's really an honor to be here once again, uh, Chair, to talk to you and to the members of the uh, committee and to the Chair of the Queens delegation. Uh, Karen Koswitz, it's always a pleasure to see you and it's always a pleasure to interact with you around libraries and you may be new uh, to the committee, but as indicated, uh, you are a person who has been there for the Queens Library for years and years and years and years and we truly appreciate all of your support. And to also to your other new member from Queens, uh, Councilman Moya, uh, my best to him as well. He has been a stalwart advocate uh, in his former life uh, for our libraries and now in his new role as council member we always look forward to his support and actually have appeared together already in his new roles so we thank him for his leadership and his total commitment to all of us as you know uh, queen's library alone maintains a collection that consists of print and digital materials uh, in 223 languages and our total circulation of materials and languages other than english last year was 1.3 million while our numbers are impressive, they are vulnerable to stagnation and decline unless we keep pace with the ever-changing learning needs of this most heterogeneous city in the world. For example, in a recent survey of the Queens Library customers as part of our process for developing our strategic plan, we heard repeated calls for additional investment in the number and variety of print and electronic books, job skills, and training programs for immigrants and resources to provide meaningful learning experience to our teenagers. 
We are committed to delivering for them and are looking forward to working with you on behalf of them and the patrons of our sister library systems. Uh, before I get further into my remarks, I want to also acknowledge all the other members of the committee who have been there, whether they're representing all the other boroughs or the borough of Queens itself. Uh, you are stalwart supporters of us and we truly value your support as well. And thank you for all the outstanding commitment to guaranteeing free access to information, learning opportunities, and the joy of discovery for everyone we serve in person, on the phone, or over the internet. You have consistently demonstrated that the people of New York deserve the city's firm financial support. Immigrant New Yorkers at the forefront of Queens Library mission are extremely important. The proof that we are indeed delivering uh, for our customers is in the numbers. Last year, Queens Library Programs and Services drew a record 1.4 million people, an increase of 27% from the previous year. Many of the participants are immigrant New Yorkers. For them, Queens Library offers the first stop on the path towards their dreams in this country. Of the 2.3 million people who live in Queens, nearly half were born outside of the United States. Let me repeat that. Of the 2.3 million people who live in Queens, nearly half were born outside of the United States. Queens Library provides classes, workshops, and services in the language spoken by the borough's immigrant communities, uh, which assist new immigrants to adapt to life in America and offer programs that celebrate the cultures of the diverse ethnic groups in Queens. Last year, we offered 126 English for speakers of other language classes at 36 sites across our system to nearly 4,000 individuals with 7,100 sessions and attendance of nearly 90,000 individuals. We presented citizenship classes, citizenship application assistance, and confidential financial counseling to 2,000 people. Queens Library has long been the primary destination of immigrant New Yorkers. With the establishment of our New Americans program in 1977, we became the first public library in the nation to provide comprehensive programs and services to newcomers. The goal was to help them to adjust to their new home and keep them connected to what they left behind by building a multilingual collection and creating relevant programming, such as coping skills, workshops, native language coding classes, and cultural events. To keep pace with the ever-changing communities of Queens, members of our staff scan federal and local demographic data to pinpoint where the borough's newcomers live and where they are from. This information is enhanced by what our community librarians are seeing on the ground. They reach out to their communities to understand who is living in the diverse neighborhoods of Queens and look out for telling details like new restaurants, new newspapers and languages other than English on the newsstands. Through our New Americans program, we presented to more than 4,000 people coping skill workshops in Spanish, Spanish, Mandarin, Bengali, Korean, and Russian, the five most spoken languages in Queens aside from English. Professionals, including lawyers, social workers, doctors, business experts, guide them through the immigration law, citizenship, housing, workers' rights, starting a business, finding a job, parenting, and health. The program works in close partnership with organizations such as the United States Citizenship uh, Immigration Services, the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Queen Borough President's Immigration Task Force, Women for Afghan Women, New York Tibetan Services Center, and many, many others. It helps people to get real results uh, people like Robert Melbourne, a recent immigrant from Jamaica, seeking to improve his reading skills. Last July, Robert enrolled in literacy classes and went from a second grade reading level to a fifth grade reading level with less, less than 20 weeks of instruction. He also sought employment opportunities. Uh, the library helped him create a resume and referred him to a, another of our signature initiatives, our Job and Business Academy. Through its services, Robert received security guard training and certification and recently obtained his employment authorization and a New York State driver's license and was hired by a major shipping company. The Job Business Academy provides specialized training 
learning opportunities with an emphasis on technology, training to job seekers, aspiring entrepreneurs, and business owners. In fiscal year 2017, the Job Business Academy staff served 25,422 customers with 41,366 hours of training in individual and individual assistance. In total, the Job Business Academy offered 700 technology training classes, 700 job search workshops, 175 entrepreneurship and small business workshops, and 84 job skill training workshops. The Job Business Academy prepares Queens residents to thrive in the modern workforce. Individuals seeking access to Job Business Academy services get started by using the Job Map, an innovative online job skills assessment tool developed by the Queens Library. Based on assessment and one-on-one -on -one interviews with Job Business Academy staff, customers are enrolled in structured job search classes, workshops, and technology training classes. The Job Business Academy also runs a free incubator for aspiring entrepreneurs in conjunction with the New York City uh, Economic Development Corporation called the Jamaica Feast Program, Food Entrepreneurship and Services Training Space. The program was created to provide resources to those who are looking to start and run their own food business in Queens. Those who participate in this program learn the fundamentals of getting a start in the food business with hands-on workshops, access to a commercial kitchen, and one-on-one -on -one session with industry expert. The program is the only one of its kind in Queens. Workshops cover a range of topics including financial planning, marketing, and food industry best practices. It is ideal for neighborhood cooks seeking to expand their experience, new Americans looking to start a business, and, recently, and recent culinary school graduates who want to learn the business side of the food world. The program has achieved some amazing outcomes for its participants, like a woman named Tress Walker, founder of Mum's Kitchen, let me plug her again, Mum's Kitchen, uh, in Jamaica, which sells West Indian cuisine and baked goods. Her vision was to create a space where mums, like her uh, from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds, could cook together and sell their goods. Through the program, she gained all of the legal, financial, and logistical knowledge needed to build her business. Next month, mums will be debuting next month at the night market at Flushing Meadows Park. Just as it's never too late for adults to start a business or to take their career in a new direction, we believe it is never too late for adults to learn how to read, improve their writing skills, or get a high school equivalency diploma. Our full-time professional staff and volunteers facilitate writing groups, technology-assisted instruction, and ongoing tutoring. Last year, these sessions helped 1,300 adults become better readers and writers and prepared 500 adults prepare for their high school equivalency exams. But we also know that the joy of learning is not just for the able-bodied and younger adults. That's why we operate a mailer book program for those who are homebound uh, with an annual mailer book circulation of 50 thousand people we have dedicated staff that recommends books in different formats from large print to electronic version and mails them to our customers on a regular basis. We offer a wealth of programs and resources that help older adults population build relationships with people of all ages as well as nurture their creativity and growth. For example, the library holds an annual Older Adults Day Fair, which I will probably attend soon, uh, which features free health screenings, live entertainment, and information on health care, benefits, and other important topics from partner organizations like Live On New York, the North Shore LIJ, Long Island Jewish Cancer Services, and local senior centers. Customers also have access to programs such as Intergenerational Creative Arts Program, book discussion groups, live performances and readings, talks and panel discussions, film screenings, drama clubs, chess clubs, arts and crafts, our Stay Well exercise program, which introduces adults over 60, again, I will qualify for that, uh, to special exercises, relaxation techniques, and principles of good nutrition. 
Computer training courses, we offer a range of classes appropriate for older learners, including beginning classes on using computers, the internet, email, Microsoft programs, Google, Facebook, and other technologies, and social media. Let me take a minute to focus on the capital part of our life as well. Maintaining our 65 locations and aging infrastructure is a short and long-term challenge for us. We're very lucky in Queens. We have had and continue to have dedicated council members who get it. They get it big time as far as the importance of investment in the infrastructure and our Queens delegation has been truly outstanding along with three successive borough presidents as well who have constantly invested in our infrastructure. Even with them getting it, we still have a lot more work to do. The average community library in Queens is over 60 years old. More than a third of our buildings are over 50 years old. They are heavily used and most were not constructed to accommodate the traffic that we experience on a daily basis due to the growth and demand of our services. The library has identified a capital funding need of nearly $173 million over the next 10 years. 46 million in fiscal year 2019 to address the critical infrastructure issues and to modernize all of our facilities and bring them in a state of good repair. Immediate critical infrastructure needs exist in our Astoria, Douglaston, Flushing, Forest Hills, Queensboro Hills, Ridgewood, Steinway, and Whitestone Community Libraries. Uh, the mayor and the city council's capital investment in libraries over the last several years have had a significant and positive impact on the state of our facilities. However, it's clear that ne much needs to be done, and your continued support is critical. When the library is forced to make, as Linda has indicated so ably and always so well, as far as in critical infrastructure around emergency needs, uh, it comes out of our expense budget and sometimes not from the capital side. And that takes away from critical needed programming. We do not have the luxury of waiting for the capital procurement and construction process to play itself out. In order to prevent our buildings from being closed to our customers for months on end, the library finds itself in an unfortunate position where operating funds are necessary, funds that should be used for our customers, using them for capital repairs. Additional operating funds are needed to maintain the increased amount of services we provide to our customers six days a week and to address the emergency capital repairs to our libraries. Before I close, I want to draw our attention to an article that was in today's uh, New York Times. And it wasn't about libraries, but if you take a look at it, it could be sometime in the very near future about libraries. And the article is about Toys R Us and how Toys R Us is declaring bankruptcy. And if you really read that article, it talks about both the indebtedness of Toys R Us, but also the competition that it faced and the pressure it put on it for now to declare bankruptcy and close basically all of the United States stores. We don't want to be in that position. We need your continued investment and support because we have shown and produced on a record basis that the customers need us and as we've said, Libraries are for everyone. Thank you for your support, and we truly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to my colleagues, Linda and Dennis, as always, for their eloquence, uh, and to all of the library colleagues who are here, the DC 37 leadership, Val Colon, our, our local president. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Van Brammer. Uh, Council Member Koslowitz and all of the City Council have been stalwart supporters of the library. We know that you know how important our public libraries are, and we are so grateful to you for that and for this opportunity to uh, testify. Um, we are here simply to ask you to continue to invest and to invest further in our libraries for all the reasons that my colleagues have made clear. Uh, in FY19, the New York Public Libraries ask, uh, as part of our TRILI ask, is an additional $7 million. Um, the majority of that will go to strengthening and maintaining and ensuring our six-day service with our great staff and making sure that they continue to be paid what they need to be paid and what is fair to pay them, adding to our collections as well as uh, $1.1 million towards our research centers, including the Schomburg, where I was last evening in Harlem. Um, we thank, again, the Council for your amazing support. You know, we know how vital library services are to all New Yorkers, to making this city great. 
whether it's from early literacy to English language classes, video visitation, just to name a few, which I will highlight quickly this morning. Early literacy is one where uh, we play a particularly vital role at a moment when the city is investing more in pre-K literacy. We are the vital partners in that. Uh, the New York Public Library now welcomes three quarters of a million attendees. Uh, so 750,000 slots in our early literacy program for a year. That's up from about 200,000 just in FY15. So a massive increase as a partnership uh, to ensure that our city's youth have the opportunities to learn to read, particularly in the poor neighborhoods where so many families don't even have books at home and need to come to us and get our support and our help uh, so that they can help their kids uh, learn how to read. We are proud to have partnered with the City Council's First Readers Initiative. New York Public Library distributed more than 105,000 uh, early literacy kits. Um, we really are the foundation for literacy in this town, and we all know that that is the foundation for opportunity, for skills, for jobs, and for democracy. We partner with uh, the Administration for Children's Services, as well as the Department of Education's Pre-K and 3K for All initiatives. We provide direct services by going into pre-K, <laughs> I'll try that again, pre-K classrooms, um, and providing book lists. In fact, I'm particularly um, proud to say that just in the last six months, the uh, circulation of material for our youth from our collections is up 27%. That's just in six months. So it is vital that we also have the resources to ensure that we have and grow our collections. We want the kids who come in and do pre-K literacy with us to grab those books on the way out so they can take them home and continue that work at home with their parents or their caregivers or their grandparents. Um, we don't have the resources to ensure that we have the books that New York's kids need. This is, you know, 2018. Uh, we can, this is New York. We cannot have a lack of just the basic materials for our kids to learn that we need them to learn. Turning to our immigrant community, which of course this city is, uh, almost everyone here comes from a background of immigrants. And as Dennis said, so many of our current citizens uh, we're not born in this country. We're proud of that. It's what makes New York so strong and so special. And so many of those uh, from the immigrant community uh, want to learn English and look to us for help. In the past five years, we've invested in our English language classes and increased them by 500%. That's a five-fold increase. Uh, we also provide, as, as Dennis and Linda described, citizenship classes, and now even legal services in the libraries. Um, after we are, the New York Public Library is the largest provider of English language instruction after the public schools and CUNY in this city. We need to maintain that, and we need to do more. We're particularly delighted, to, just last year, we launched English language classes at uh, two Rikers Island correctional facilities. Um, we, uh, we continue to maintain and have to maintain collections in a great variety of languages. Um, I was recently at the Andrew High School Talking Book and Braille Library uh, in Manhattan, which is a uh, federally uh, supported uh, center for uh, tri -li, uh, for tri -li and for three states. Um, I met with a blind patron who had immigrated recently from Syria, a, a, a country obviously in deep distress. She came to the high school library to learn to read Braille, and she was using that to now work towards a high school equivalency degree so that she can then find a job and find the opportunity that America and New York promise that Syria has tragically uh, failed to deliver on, uh, to put it mildly. Turning then to incarcerated and the formerly incarcerated um, who deserve our support, uh, we all know that America has a crisis of incarceration. There are far too many of our fellow citizens. Um, we need to make sure that they get support and services so that um, 
they can return to their families and their communities and find jobs and not return to incarceration. In 2016, in a moving ceremony, after years of pushing carts around on Rikers Island, we finally opened our first dedicated library space at the Rosie M. Singer facility, um, and we uh, will be opening a second dedicated library in the Manhattan Detention Complex this spring. We, uh, we've been providing, circulating more than 30,000 books and magazines. It's heartwarming to see literally the library staff carrying bags of books with them every day, and guards from the facilities bringing books and contributing them, uh, and everyone working on these efforts together. The video visitation program that you have supported has uh, enabled us to uh, bring together and keep together 234 families and 22 branches over the past year, and we have just recently expanded that program to two new Bronx locations. Um, we have to, we have to do better by these populations. Um, even the, the, the formerly incarcerated folks come to us for computer training. We have a set of special resources for them that we publish in a, in a program called Connections. Um, it's just, it, it's one of the symbolisms of this is often for people leaving Rikers Island, they get off at 125th Street and the very first stop they go to is the 125th Street Library. Mm -hmm. um, that's where they can find a computer, it's where they can find a reading material, it's where they can get information about housing, information about jobs. Um, we are the first stop for so many in America and so many in New York who depend upon us. Um, we, uh, we also know, as my colleagues des described, we need the staff and we need the collections for those programs and services, but we cannot do it if our facilities are falling apart. Again, this is New York in 2018, and New Yorkers deserve, particularly in the poorer neighborhoods where they may not have other opportunities, facilities that live up to the standards of this city. Thanks to you and the mayor, we are now in the 10-year capital plan. We are on schedule to renovate five historic Carnegie branches, including that branch on 125th Street, which is often a first stop after Rikers Island, and for so many in that neighborhood. But we have an ongoing maintenance crisis. Our, we have asked you this year for a combined $60 million additional capital investment. We have work to do. Some of it isn't glamorous. Mechanical systems and energy conservation, building envelope and preservation work, ADA improvements and, and IT infrastructure. But given that the average age of our libraries is 67 years old and many of our branches date back more than 100 years, um, this is work that is absolutely essential. Let me give you a few quick examples. St. George Library Center in Staten Island. The roof isn't holding any longer. The paint is peeling off the walls as water comes cascading down. The windows are rotting. Each aspect of this adds to further combinations of difficulties on physical structure. The, the front steps and the ramp there are crumbling. This just cannot be. The, in the Bronx, the staff at the Tremont Library are putting pails under leaks of water. They, they can't spend the time serving the citizens of that location when they're running around trying to put pails, garbage cans, to collect water leaks. At the Columbus Library in Manhattan, we have an entrance that is inaccessible to those with disabilities. They, people are even haul, have to haul their heavy strollers up to get into the library with their children so that they can learn to read. This simply cannot be. We need your help to upgrade, we need your help to maintain, and we need your help to ensure that all of our facilities are not only up to standard, but inspiring, welcoming spaces as the core civic locations in every neighborhood. Libraries are truly for everyone. They are for our immigrants, they're for our job seekers, um, there's for, for children seeking early literacy help. 
They are what makes New York great. We're so grateful for your support. We're grateful for the opportunity to testify. We have no doubt that the City Council and Mayor de Blasio um, not only have made significant investments in the libraries, but will continue to do so. We need more to keep up the momentum. At this moment in history, we need the great staff fairly paid. We need the buildings up to standards and inspiring. We need the collections so that we can provide. Those are the basics of the library. And they are the basics of what make the libraries the heart of this city of opportunity for all of our citizens now and going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much to all three of our library systems presidents and CEOs for your eloquent testimony. Um, I do want to recognize we've been joined by another new member of the committee, Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, also of Queens. We are very Queens-centric right now on this uh -huh. dais. Um, never a bad thing. Uh, I also want to say to Council Member Moya, if you get a chance to, uh, uh, when you can't sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning and watch back this when it airs on NYC TV, Dennis Walcott said the nicest things about you um, it, is, it is worth going back and watching it. Um, he gave you a huge shout out um, before. I just want to make sure you were aware that. Uh, My mom watches it and called me and said, why am I not there <laughs> <laughs> while you were speaking? So Dennis, I have a lot of explaining to do and thank you. <laughs> uh, it was well-deserved praise. Um, at one point also in your presentation, Tony, I looked out and I saw a lot of people smiling in the audience and I was wondering what they were smiling about and it was because this photo came up on the, uh, on the screen, uh, perhaps the most adorable child in the city of New York. Um, just for showing us this photo and making everyone smile, you deserve the $16 million <laughs> that you asked for. Um, I gave you another photo. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have a couple of questions and I know my uh, colleagues, um, uh, both would, would like to, to speak as well. So listen, you, you know where I stand. There's no point in, in debating it. Obviously, you do incredible work. Uh, I loved the testimony about all of the various ways that you are partnering with other organizations. I just hope everyone in the world knows that you've, you've got robotics clubs and, and you've got all these incredible programs for our immigrant communities, and, and they know that you're so much more than uh, uh, books and materials, but in fact you're community centers and you're the hubs of communities and you're really doing so much work and your staff, the workers, um, do incredible work and they deserve and need to be paid uh, appropriately and so we need to continue th to reinvest. So I myself obviously uh, love libraries and, and love books and I know your collections have uh, uh, struggled to maintain pace with the usage that you get. So um, just uh, for all three, very quickly, uh, where are you at in terms of your, your budget for materials, books, other materials? Where would you like to be? Uh, what's, what's the need for the three systems? Because I'm assuming that with some of the money, the additional money were you to uh, secure it this year, you would bolster your collections. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, uh, back in, in FY15, our branch collections budget, so separate from the research library, was just under $16 million, and that's pretty much where it stays today. And that's after years of both the costs of material going up and, thank God, circulation and therefore demand for material going up. So we're simply not keeping pace. We want to add at least a million dollars from our request to catch up uh, to that and to do better than that. Um, and of course, we also have additional material we didn't use to circulate at these numbers, electronic material. All of that requires additional investment. Brooklyn Public Library um, is currently spending $9, nine million dollars on collections and with the additional uh, increase, we would hope to get to 10. Um, I will say that uh, during the years when the system was experiencing budget cuts, of course, the first place that we went was to the materials collection uh, to save jobs and library hours. 
Um, we've been building back steadily over time, but we still feel that we're not keeping pace with demand or, frankly, um, with what our um, colleagues around the country are doing. Um, so an additional million dollars would go to the collections budget. So in Queens, we're woefully behind. Uh, currently, we're spending roughly six million. And again, that, as Linda indicated, is a gradual build from when we were in the recession period, and, but still that's not satisfactory. And also part of our strategic planning process, we did the uh, customer and consumer surveys, and number one on the hit list was collections, 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 and we want more, and we want more diversity, and we want more you know, e uh, books and materials as well. And so as we get new dollars in, we try to put it into collections. But this investment that we're asking you for would definitely help us enhance our collections and our publications and materials. And, and I'll just stipulate from my side, the capital need is clear. Uh, and, and you need that funding. That funding is desperately needed. So um, I won't ask you any questions about it because I know how deeply needed that funding is. My last question is before I turn to Councilmember Kozlowitz and Councilmember Moya. Uh, we talk about staff all the time. Obviously, incredibly important that the staff um, are paid. But I wanted to just ask, in terms of your unionized, non-unionized, um, where are you at? Uh, how, how have those increases over the last, because you've been doing some hiring over the last several years, thankfully. Um, how, how has that changed, if at all? Um, and uh, I know, because I worked at a library for 11 years, that people love working for the library. And so your attention generally is pretty good, because once people start to work at one of the, your three library systems, uh, they realize how powerful it is, and they love their jobs. So if the three of you really quickly could also talk about the union versus non-union staff, um, your hiring over the last three years, and, and retention. So in Queens, we've been hiring, and thanks to the investment on the part of the city council and the mayor's office, and uh, the significant proportion of people that we've hired are on the union side. So, so 7 one 17 through, through 15, 18, we've hired. Uh, 43 new union workers out of a total of 61, 71, 16 through 630, 17, we hired 61 uh, union workers. And then from 71, 15 through 630, 16, we hired an additional 167 uh, union workers and from a base of 197. So as you can see, we have been hiring and really in the communities and the significant proportion of those individuals represent our union. Linda or Tony? Or? Sure. Um, sorry. So uh, in FY16, which is the last time we got an increase in operating dollars, I will add, um, Brooklyn Public Library hired 95 um, uh, new people, all of which were union. Our current breakdown between union and non-union is 849 union members and 163 non-union members. Um, we have a retention rate of over 90%, um, sometimes hovering in the 95% uh, percent range. Um, I don't have the breakdown by, um, by category within our staff, um, but it is a place where people like to work, um, and we're thrilled to have um, such high levels. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the New York Public Library today has a unionized staff of about 1,500 and a non-unionized staff of just over 500, and that's roughly comparable ratios uh, going back for a very long time. Uh, the last time we got the increase, uh, some years back, three years back, uh, we, uh, we hired 120 new members of the staff because we know the people who work at the library are the essential ingredient. All of those were unionized staff, as Linda, and I think the same with Dennis, we have a retention rate of some hovering somewhere in the sort of 94, 95 percent through natural uh, turnover, even though people love staying and working at the library, and we love having them. Um, we have currently 40 union positions vacant that we are searching for. So, um, but let's be clear, um, what we applaud the city council and the mayor's uh, raising of the minimum wage, of adding family leave benefits and others. Um, you could do the math as easily as I can. If the costs go up, which we agree they should because people need to be paid more, um, 
and, and have their rights protected in the ways that you have ensured, if the budget doesn't go up, you know, it makes it hard for us to maintain all the commitments that you want us to maintain and that we want to maintain. And if I may add just one quick point, I mean, when you take a look at Imagine our respective staff, they reflect the diversity of the city as well. And all you need to do is take a look in the audience and beyond, and you see the core of our city who are on the staff of our respective libraries. And our goal is to make sure that we provide them the living opportunities to have a successful life. And so that's why we're requesting the increase to meet the basics and to have the people who are the diversity and the community uh, who are employed at our libraries. Thank you. Uh, and we'll be hearing from DC 37, all of our local presidents in the next panel, uh, right after my colleagues um, have an opportunity to weigh in. So I'll ask Councilmember Koslowitz to speak. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for the work that you do for our New York Public Libraries for the people of our city. Uh, I'm going to be a little nimby right now <laughs> uh, to Dennis Walcott, who has been a fresh, a, 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 a breath of fresh air to our system. The Rigo Park Library, which we have worked on for many, many years, putting money into it since the 90s, and every time we thought we were getting close, the price of the library went up. And thanks to Dennis and the mayor, we finally have the money there that we could do something with the library. Where are we at with this library? I have my NIMBY file here as well, so I am very well prepared with our NIMBY file. Uh, we have a full commitment of money for Rigo Park, and so uh, we're in the final stages of uh, getting the details together and to deal with the release, and so Rigo Park is fully committed, and so we're very happy about that, and we're looking at a variety of different designs right now, and we'll be sitting down, because. I imagine, like my colleagues, we sit down with our individual council members and go over all the libraries in their respective districts. So Regal Park is a part of that. So we are fully committed. Thank you, and thank, thanks to you, and thanks to the mayor for making this a reality. I just want to tell all of you that libraries are very important to me, and during budgets, I will be fighting for the libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the chair of our Queen's delegation. And, and uh, it is uh, great news indeed uh, for all of us to know that uh, Councilwoman Kostowitz will be in our corner fighting for us. And congratulations, Councilwoman. I know how long you've been fighting for that library to happen. Uh, that is a great victory. Uh, now to hear from uh, the highly praised <laughs> Councilmember Francisco Moya. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Chairman, thank you so much for uh, your lifelong fight to improve our libraries uh, in Queens and throughout the city uh, in helping guide this committee in making sure that uh, we have a voice uh, during this process. Uh, to Dennis, uh, I really wasn't lying. Uh, my mother really does watch the legislative channel. She did that uh, all throughout my career in the assembly, and she said to me in Spanish, she said, hay un hombre muy elegante that's in Spanish, who's saying, there's a really elegant man speaking highly of you. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tell her gracias. I, yeah, I, I, will. <laughs> I will, I will. But I just want to say to you, Dennis, thank you uh, for your kind words, but more for your dedication and your work um, for Queens and the libraries uh, that have really been suffering for so long. Um, I grew up in Corona. Corona Library has been my library. Um, for many years, um, you know, you've come to visit, you've seen the struggles, um, but we've also been very proud of the work that you've done to help in the expansion of the surrounding libraries. We see what the beautiful library in Elmhurst um, that has come up. Uh, there's just some fantastic work that's being done, but we are now um, talking about $25 million in renovations to the Corona branch. Uh -huh. Can you provide uh, an update 
on the renovations and kind of where we are with that? Sure, so we're looking, Corona is an interesting study in that Corona is just a high demand library, yeah. as you well know, and the number of people who come through their doors is amazing, and also, as you well know, and I imagine the chair and the chair of the Queen's delegation knows, that we have a house that we've purchased as well. So we've explored a number of designs that incorporate the house that we purchased on the lot that's somewhat next door to the existing library and how we bridge the two. Uh, and as you know, we're talking to the borough president and others as far as uh, the funding that goes along with Corona. So Corona is hot on our hit parade as far as developing the next steps and we're ready to talk about uh, the commitment of additional money as far as making it work. Uh, part of what we're looking at is the intersection of the two, and so I think the challenge is whether we go up and out or just out across the house and the existing library. So we're at the Great. final stages of working on that. Also in your district, we have East Elmhurst that's wrapping up as yeah. well. And so we're on target as far as completion date with East Elmhurst. Uh, so that's moving forward. And then the other one in your district is Left Rack City. Yep. And Left Rack City, uh, we just had a meeting about Left Rack City and doing total reformation of the Left Rack uh, uh, Library as well. And so the next step is we'll be placing a call to look for a space as we move forward on Left Rack and talk about alternative space and then deal with the capital renovation of Left Rack and shutting that down for a period of time to do the total renovation. So a number of the libraries in your district, we are ready to move and I think with Corona in particular going back to that, I think that the challenge is the demand on that library and as you know better than I do, how we're basically landlocked there as far as yeah. space availability and what that means. And so I think that's what we're working on right now. Do you, do you see a timetable for when we would? Hold on, I'm going to look in the, the audience. Do we have a? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, but we're set up to meet with you so we can yeah, work that fine. out and then that's fine. go with that. And um, just on on your Wi-Fi programs, that I think is a great program, especially uh -huh. in uh, communities of of color where we have very limited access to Wi-Fi. Have you found that program to work, and is this something where we can invest more money in to that program? So not just work, it has been an outstanding success. And so we have a relatively new VP of IT who is just outstanding, and he's exploring a variety of different ways to expand that. But again, the challenge is, as we've all indicated in our respective systems, of having more expense money, which allows us to do those type of right. programmatic things and not to suck those monies away into dealing with infrastructure needs as well. So the Wi-Fi program has been an extreme success. We're looking to expand it and build up the bandwidth as far as capacity uh, through all of our different libraries. And we have a potential project that we'll be announcing shortly that uh, would doing in joint partnership with someone else to give us additional capacity as well. That's great. Well, well thank you, Dennis, for your dedication um, to, to the kids in Queens and the folks that use the libraries. Um, we will be fighting extremely hard, and we have our delegation chair who uh, will be leading that fight, and of course with our chairman, uh, we will do everything possible to make sure that our libraries are fully funded so that uh, the people of uh, Queens and, and the great city of New York will have access to um, having really full funded libraries um, throughout the city. And, and thank you for all the great work that you all do. And thank you for your leadership as well. Appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Chairman. Much to my amazing colleagues, and I, I just want to uh, uh, let uh, Linda and Tony know that we love them equally. Yeah. Um, uh, even though we're we're uh, uh, we're feeling our, our queensness right now, um, and uh, and loving every minute of it. So, um, uh, in the Bronx, so. <laughs> there you go. My father was born in Brooklyn. It's, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, we love all of you. So uh, thank you uh, to our three library uh, systems for your testimony, for your passion, for the service and the work that you do, uh, and most importantly, for the people that you serve. Uh, we're going to excuse this panel and welcome the presidents of our DC 37 locals, uh, John Hislop, uh, president of uh, Queens Library Guild Local 1321,
uh, Ron Barber, uh, president of DC 37, local 1482, the Brooklyn Public Library employees, and Val Cologne, president of DC 37, local 1930, uh, representing uh, New York Public Library uh, workers as well. And then we'll have one last panel of four um, after that. Oh, and also Mr. Paul. All right, our library local presidents, if you would, have a seat. We're gonna begin this portion of the testimony. Thank you, Karen, thank you. And we are uh, running a little late. We have the Department of Cultural Affairs coming in right after, so we're going to uh, uh, go to a three-minute clock. Um, and uh, we're thrilled to have all of you here, all four of you here. I see Mr. Paul is here as well, so I wanna recognize you as well. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, determined an order of speaking for uh, the four of you, but I'll just say um, uh, on behalf of uh, the members of the panel and Francisco Moya, I'm sure agrees that DC 37 and the workers of DC 37 are incre incredibly important uh, to the work of our libraries and to our city, uh, we value greatly the work of all four locals that are represented here, and most importantly, uh, the men and women of DC 37. So with that, um, whichever order you all have decided it would like to go in. Mr. Barber, you first? All right. Test, okay, I'm on. So I'm going to um, be reading the joint testimony, no pun intended and joint, but the joint <laughs> testimony of all three of the locals uh, this, this morning. Um, Mr. Chairman, Jimmy Van Brenner, and fellow committee members, thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to uh, testify before you this morning. Um, my fellow presidents um, uh, will testify this morning to the Committee of uh, Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations hearing on the three library system budget. Val Colon, president of local 1930, Leonard Paul, newly uh, appointed president of local 374, Jan Heisler, uh, president of local 1321, and I, Ronaldo Barber, uh, president of local 1482, come before you, united in our requests for more library funding. This year requests come from another year of funding stability and security. However, that funding is still insufficient. Our custodians, librarians, drivers, ESO, teachers, clerk, IT workers struggle to meet the ever-increasing demands our elected official and patrons place on us. In fiscal year 2017 and 18, the city council and mayor maintain our library funding, allowing us to plan. In fiscal year 2019, we are reassured that the mayor has propose the same amount of money as last year. This positive development is underscored with the warning the unions have repeated at this hearing since fiscal year 2017. The funding is not enough. New York City library systems are bursting and our patrons are demanding more from us every day. At Brooklyn Public Library, because of the increasing number of buildings reopening and additional programs and services that we provide, there is not enough staff to maintain the growing demand for safety, cleanliness, and service that the branches in our community provide. There is a great need for more staff in order to service our community branches, such as custodians, special officers, in addition to clerical and IT staff. 
at New York Public Library, inadequate funding has left many branches suffering from staff shortage. Staff shortage have created, in some cases, security issues that need to be addressed. Some branches, at times, are staffed with two people to open and close. The Bronx Library Center is one location that is under staff, and it's not for an overtime budget, the branch services would have to be cut. The staff at Staten Island, Todd Hill, Westerley Library, invariable must leave the reference desk on staff with a sign directing patrons to the circulation desk for help because they do not have enough, sorry, enough staff. The hours at the short staff science industry and business library were increased. To alleviate some of this strain, Mid-Manhattan Library staff were transferred there while Mid-Manhattan is closed for renovation. Now, some of those staff members have been removed and the hours stay the same, exacerbating a short staffing situation even more. At the Queens Library, there are many examples of why more funds are needed. There are just a few, these are just a few, I'm sorry. Elmore's Library, one of the highest circulating branches in the nation, was newly renovated. The branch added two new floors, expanded its footprint, increased the size of Adult Learning Center, and increased hours. The size of the staff remained almost the same as it was before the renovations. <laughs> Excuse me. Glen Hawks Library expanded, adding more floors and hours and the staff size remain the same. Hunter Point Library will be a brand new location with many floors and a large collection to maintain. Queens Library does not have the extra money to hire more people to staff this brand new building. Our members are contending with all the mandate placed on us. Six day service, large newly renovated or brand new buildings, new programs, more space to clean and maintain, more books, DVDs, newspapers, strong Wi-Fi, laptop, desktop, scanners, printers, copier, mobile Wi-Fi, and more. Our patrons not only appreciate all of this, they demand more. Our members are exemplars of the mission of public library. They are dedicated to providing free access to information, programs, and services. We have proven that the printed word and the digital space coexist to, and strive. We have proven that our programs and services are vital to our community. We have proven that if a library is renovated or a new one is built, the community flock to us. To meet everyone's demand for more programs, new or li larger libraries, more materials, more technologies, our elected official must not only maintain current funding, but increase it. Speaking on behalf of the staff who work so hard to make library service a reality, we say, please help us maintain and enhance the service we so diligently strive to provide our communities. <laughs> With the collaboration of this mayor, the members of city council and our New York City libraries, we have done great things. We need your help to maintain the level of service without exhausting our staff. You are agri agriculturists, expert farmers. You know the libraries are good grounds, and when you sow in these fertile grounds, we provide much fruit for our patrons and staff and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done, Mr. Barber. Um, and I gave you extra time because you said the entire full name of my committee, which takes about two minutes just to say the full, no, full name of my committee. Um, thank you so much for representing so well uh, all four of the locals represented and all of the workers that uh, uh, do such an amazing job. And, as you know, for 11 years, I worked side by side uh, by John at the, at the Queens Library and, and uh, saw firsthand the, the work that uh, the members of DC 37 do at all of our libraries. And, and I agree that uh, you need more and uh, I'm going to do everything I can uh, to fight 
for more, uh, as we've had some uh, very good years uh, recently, but we still need to finish the work and, and do more because your members deserve that from uh, your city government. So with that, I just want to say thank you to uh, all four of you. Uh, I don't know if uh, Councilmember Moya has anything to uh, add. I think he uh, believes very strongly, as I do, in the work that all of you do, and we deeply appreciate DC 37 and all of your locals. So thank you very much to all four of you. Thank you, thank you. And I see the cultural community is gathering in the back. Um, like a strong force, a cultural wave coming over us. Um, but I do not see Commissioner Finkelperl, all right? Can I make sure he knows that we switched rooms if the commissioner went to the other Okay. Uh, all right, so we have a couple of folks from the public who would like to testify on libraries. Um, once we spot the commissioner, we will hear from the commissioner and then do public, but right now, since we have uh, some time, Tress Walker, is Tress Walker here? Would you like to come forward? Tress, you were uh, shouted out in Dennis Walcott's testimony in a big way, and now uh, we're gonna have to go to Mum's Kitchen in Jamaica and uh, check that out. Uh, Anna Diaz, is Anna Diaz? Still we're here? Gonna, we're gonna be here later. Okay, great. We're gonna be here later. Joel Ochoa, did I see Joel? Is Joel here? Maybe they're gonna come a little bit later for the public testimony, that's great. Tiffany Johnson as well. Bashir Osmani. Okay, we'll hear from them later. And then we also have... Boss, could you exit quietly, please? So is it Eek Williams? E.K. Williams, is E.K. Williams here? Right, right. Would you, thank you. Uh, Laman Isaac? Lamine Isaac, would you like to come forward? And Yosenex, Yosenex Orengo? All right, so we'll hear from this panel of library workers and activists and lovers. We'll go to uh, a three minute clock and ask everyone to be um, passionate and succinct at the same time as we await uh, our commissioner as well. So Ms. Walker, since you got the biggest shout out of the day, tell us all about your experience at the Queen's Library and Mum's Kitchen. Good afternoon. It's an honor for me to be here for speaking with you today. Every journey begins with a single step. Many distinguished people have quoted this. I would like to add my piece. Every journey begins with the understanding that where you are no longer suits you. The journey begins with the decision that you will no longer stay in your current situation and you take your first step. Can I my just interrupt for one second? We need your name for the record. My name is Tress Walker, T-R-E-S-S -S -S Walker. Thank you. Should I begin from the beginning again or just continue? Continue. My steps led me here today, to this moment where I have the opportunity to share with you why the Queen's Central Library is a critical part of the Jamaica Queen's landscape, why the Job and Business Academy is virtually impo important to its residents, and why increased funding is necessary. My journey here began after what could have been considered a life-ending accident. On my way to physical therapy one beautiful morning, my phone buzzed as I'm locking my door. My brother texts me about a class being offered at the Central Library. As I'm reading the information, the tears welled up. My pulse quickened. This was it. This was the missing part of the puzzle. I immediately signed up and the rest is a sweet memory. Jamaica Feast, food, entrepreneurship, and services training space under the Job and Business Academy umbrella is vitally important to those who want to start a business and are sometimes overwhelmed by all the paperwork required. The Jamaica Feast program, like many programs at the Queen's Library, 
are managed by talented and caring individuals who want to see you succeed, staffed by individuals who have the vested interest in your success. Mom's Kitchen NYC was fully birthed through the Jamaica Feast program. This team brings real world knowledge to this amazing program. They have very discerning palates and many programs have been fine tuned through their assistance. Mr. Michael Maldonia can find the tiniest needle and thread it and point you in the right direction. His world knowledge and research skills are undeniable. Ms. Tara Lal Stanton drives to see what is now the FEAST program move from a thought to a concept to actually change the lives is a testament of her commitment to make a difference. Her ideas and insights pointed us in the direction to see your products in a different light, adding depth to your product line. The students of this program are now business partners as we work on building our individual businesses while making a difference in the lives of our children and our family. We also partner with each other when needed as we work to build up our communities. If the food industry is a path that you want to explore, I know you've got one more paragraph to go, so uh, go for it. You need to be in the Jamaica Feast program. In fact, if you're struggling with life issues, work issues, uncertainty about where you belong, the Queen Central Library is a source that is sometimes overlooked. That can no longer be. Queen's Library, with an emphasis on the Job and Business Academy, is a treasure trove of skilled personnel who need the necessary resources to have a larger reach into the community and make a significant difference in the lives of many. With help, please help them to help us so we too can help others and in so doing create a legacy we can all be very proud of. Chairman Van Burr and members of the committee, thank you very much for allowing me to testify before you today. Thank you very much and congratulations. And, and uh, Francisco Moya and I are gonna go on a date to Mum's Kitchen in Jamaica and uh, check out that amazing establishment that you've got there. Um, okay, I know Commissioner Finkelpearl has uh, uh, joined us, so we're gonna hear from him right after uh, we hear from our next two speakers. So uh, who would like to go first? Flip a coin, there you go. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd like to thank the Cultural Affairs and Le Library Committees for giving me the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is E.K. Williams. I am a technology training supervisor at the Brooklyn Public Library. I have been with the library for 12, over 12 years. In the past four years, I've been working at the New Lots Library in East New York. East New York is a community which has been faced with many adversities, some of them including the addition of numerous homeless shelters, social economic issues that continue to plague individuals and their families. In addition, the neighborhood continues to be burdened by crimes that occur as a result of the aforementioned issues. In communities like East New York, the library plays a pivotal role in the livelihood of its residents. According to the Social Research Council, East New York Brooklyn has the second highest rate of youth, youth disconnect, meaning a large number of youth who are not enrolled in school or employed. As a library professional, I had the opportunity to address this issue when I piloted a new program called Documentary Photography Bootcamp. My team and I were able to teach new skills, provide a caring and nurturing environment, and positivity for youth in East New York. The goal of the program is to provide teens with professional photography skills and serve as a safe and constructive alternative to hanging out on the streets. The program's success gained national attention just this month when we won the 2018 Innovative Librarians Award from Georgia's Gwinnett County Public Library System. Throughout this library-based Sorry. Through this library-based program, we were able to address a big issue which continues to be a problem in East New York. I would like to thank our elected officials for the continued support in our communities. The generous digital inclusion grant of laptops from Council Member Barron for her new lots, East Flatbush, Cypress Hills, and Spring Creek libraries are greatly appreciated and continue to bridge the gap 
by providing successful technology education to underserved residents in, at a free cost. Although libraries are continuing to serve their populations in new and innovative ways, we cannot do it alone. We need your support. Please provide us with funding to maintain six-day service and continue providing groundbreaking programs that touch the lives of our youth and their families. Thank you. Well done. Perfectly timed, too, might I say. Um, uh, it's great to hear uh, your praise of Councilmember Barron. Uh, at her invitation, I toured the New Lots uh, branch a few years ago, and it's great to see it getting uh, some well-deserved uh, love and attention, because I know Councilmember Barron cares so very deeply about that library and all of her libraries. Uh, last but not least, um, before we are going to go right to the cultural affairs portion of our hearing. Good morning, everyone. My, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the Cultural Affairs Committee and the Library Committee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lamine Isaac, and I'm the branch manager for Macon Library in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. I'm also a resident of Brownsville, which is a few uh, steps away from the branch where I work, because I live at the tail end of Brownsville. Now, nearly 18 years ago, I was a recent college graduate who was unemployed. My job search led me to my local public library, the same library I used as a child, as a young adult, and worked for as a youth, part-time after school. The branch librarian there, uh, in his effort to help me find work, suggested that I apply to work for the library, and I did. And I think you can figure out how that turned out. <laughs> The library has had a tremendous impact on my life, just as it has a, a tremendous impact on the lives of its many users. Committee, I thank you for your support of libraries, which make our ability to help users possible. With your support, Macon Library is able to open its doors 53 hours a week, seven days a week. But that's not the case for all libraries. During that time, Macon Library is able to offer a variety of programs to meet the needs of its diverse patronage at every step of their lives. For example, we have library lanes for older adults. We have five weekly programs for children birth to five years old. We have kid and, tech, kid and teen tech time and Lego robotics. We offer career and resume help and computer classes. We're also having an artist in residency program to support our local artists. We have genealogy workshops and independent writing workshops, a variety of programs. I can go on, but I won't. We are also able to collaborate with many community partners because of our hours of service and availability. For example, Divers to Social Justice, they provide an after-school program for middle school students that focus on STEAM or Shop Healthy Brooklyn, which have brought together several organizations to conduct workshops for families to teach them how to eat well and advocate for healthy foods in their communities. Or NAMI, NAMI stands for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. We are conducting programs to see what the community needs, like support groups for people who care for persons with mental illness and or people living with mental illness. The library is not only a place for individuals and groups to come for programs and children to come for after school, but it's also a place for New York City's most vulnerable, the homeless, the older adults. They come to the library for a cool place in the summer and a warm place in the winter. We are fortunate at Macon to have 53 public service hours and we are able to do so much, but more needs to be done. With your continued support and increased support, the library will be able to increase its reach and help the patients that they serve and continue to be a place of lifelong, a lifelong learning, opportunity, and discovery. Thank you, committee, for your time and consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great job. And that is really impressive that all of that is happening at the Macon uh, Branch Library. I'm sure the Commissioner uh, of Cultural Affairs is thrilled uh, that you have artists in residence and uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, filmmakers and, and all sorts of things. And Divas for Social Justice sounds like a really fierce group of uh, women, no? It is, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're all going to have to go out there and, and meet them. Um, and, of course, you have STEAM, uh, which includes the A in STEM, right? So, yes. Uh, thank you so very much to all of you uh, for being here for the work that you do and the passion you have for libraries, uh, which obviously I hold as well. So uh, with that, uh, your panel is excused. Thank you so much for coming to City Hall today. And Thank you. if the commissioner uh, of the Department of Cultural Affairs is ready, we will go right into the cultural affairs portion of this hearing. We are going to have more public testimony uh, at around one o'clock on both libraries and culture. Um, but uh, first we will hear from our commissioner in the cultural affairs portion of the Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations Committee. Thank you to all the library supporters who are leaving and the cultural community that is arriving. We're going to now shift gears and hear from our commissioner. Um, but before we hear his testimony, you uh, do have to be sworn in. Mr. Commissioner, if you'll please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. So, Commissioner, thank you uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to have Council Member Francisco Moya uh, from Queens also uh, uh, joining. Obviously, other council members will be uh, coming and going. And everyone in the audience who uh, cares about culture and the arts in the city of New York knows how hard I have uh, fought uh, with you over the last several years. Uh, we've had some strong gains and some increases in funding that has been desperately needed. Uh, and we've seen continued support of the capital program, a robust capital program for our cultural organizations and institutions. But it is the, the increase in expense funding that has helped so many, particularly smaller cultural organizations, receive much needed infusions towards their budgets. Now, it is important to note that the City Council, through the great work uh, of the City Council over the last several years, has dramatically increased City Council cultural initiatives. The Cultural After School Adventure Program has almost tripled in the last four years alone. We created uh, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which is now over $5 million. We created the Sukasa Cultural Initiative, bringing artists to senior centers. All of that with other increases as well, where the City Council's cultural initiatives are at record levels of funding. Uh, and, and then we went even further and increased the operating support for the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, added funding for the Cultural Development Fund, and have done terrific things towards implementing the cultural plan that uh, I'm proud to have worked with Council Member Levin to support. However, all of the increases uh, that are not City Council cultural initiatives were not baselined. So $15 million that was increased last year has not been baselined by the mayor, and therefore we are technically looking at a cut of $15 million right now, unless that funding were restored. It is absolutely imperative that the mayor baseline those $15 million and allow us to then push for even more funding. Uh, but those gains 
should not be temporary. Those gains should not simply be reflected in our budgets in good times when uh, we have the ability, but instead they should be permanent markers in terms of how we regard the importance of this funding. So I'm anxious to hear <coughs> the commissioner's testimony uh, talking about that effort. Uh, and uh, obviously we'll hear questions um, after his testimony, but uh, welcome Commissioner Finkelpearl, and if you would, commence your testimony. Thank you, and let me just say before my testimony, um, I love libraries. My mother was a librarian, and both of her parents were librarians. So after cultural affairs, my heart is with those, and it was great, like you said, to hear that there's a lot of artists in residency, et cetera, going on at the libraries. Just fantastic. So that was the tail end of that. Okay. Uh, my testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I'm Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl here today to testify in regards to the Mayor's Fiscal 2018 Preliminary Budget Proposal for the Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm joined today by a number of my staff from the agency. <clears throat> First, I'll review the numbers. The agency baseline expense budget <clears throat> for 2019 in the preliminary budget uh, proposal is $142.1 million. This includes 28.5 million for the Cultural Development Fund, 106.7 million for the Cultural Institution Group, and 6.9 million for agency operations and other expenses. <clears throat> this is the preliminary, preliminary budget proposal. These figures do not include any initiatives or other one-time additions typically added at budget adoption. For the current fiscal year, our budget is $186.4 million. This is DCLA's largest ever allocation. This remarkable investment in cultural life of our communities is thanks to our strong partnership with the City Council, led by Speaker, uh, and led by the Speaker and Chair Ben Bramer. It also reflects a real commitment to the goals of Create NYC. I'll discuss these in more detail later in my testimony. I'd also like to highlight that my agency's operating expenses represent just 3.5 percent of, of our overall budget. This means that 96.5% of funds flow directly to the cultural organizations and neighborhoods that make the city a cultural powerhouse. Applications for the fiscal year 2019 Cultural Development Fund were due last month. The panel review process starts next week and, and will run through June. As always, <clears throat> we appreciate the council's consistent report, uh, support and involvement in this important process. For the current year, we are providing more than $40 million to 900 more than 900 cultural groups across the five boroughs. Thanks to our partnership with the City Council, this is the largest ever CDF allocation. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, turning to capital, DCLA's four-year capital budget currently allocates $933.84 million to projects for 250 cultural groups citywide. These projects are essential to the cultural organizations and audiences in all five boroughs, ensuring access to the best and most efficient cultural facilities and equipment. If you have entered the New York Botanical Garden through its recently um, opened East Gate or climbed aboard the gloriously restored Tall Ship Waver Tree at the South Street Seaport Museum, you've encountered city-funded DCLA capital projects. Some current highlights from our portfolio included, include replacing outdated HVAC boiler systems and fire safety systems at the Dance Theater of Harlem, renovating a new administrative facility for the Louis Armstrong House and Museum in Queens, Upgrading the South Wing Atrium at the Bronx Museum, including new efficient, energy efficient windows, HVAC upgrades and enhancement allowing for all, for improving access and multi-use programming year round. Improving the aquarium at the Staten Island Zoo, resulting in both better visitor experience and greater energy efficiency. And phase three of Brooklyn Botanic um, Gardens Southgate uh, redevelopment project, which will enhance the garden's sustainable operations and improve connections to its surrounding neighborhoods. As you know, Create uh, NYC has influenced DCLA's priorities, programs, and budget this year. There was a cultural plan oversight hearing held by this committee in September of 2017. Here's an update on a few recent announcements and markers of progress towards the goals for this uh, far-reaching program. In January, we announced the winners of the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact, which provides $500,000 for seven partnerships between city agencies and cultural organizations to fund programs benefiting underserved and vulnerable New Yorkers. These programs respond to create NYC recommendations to better integrate culture into the city services. They include partnerships between Arts East New York, 
and the New York City Department of Planning to enliven Success Garden, an underutilized community garden in East New York, and expanding the partnership between the Carnegie Hall and the Department of Probation <clears throat> to bring free verse programs and apprenticeship a project to neighborhood opportunity networks, that's neon centers, in northern Staten Island and Jamaica, Queens. DCLA launched Public Artisan Residence, uh, or PAIR, in 2015, which enable artists at, um, to work at city agencies where they work alongside staff and constituents. Great NYC called for more such collaborations. So last month, we announced new artist residencies for four city agencies, the Department of Probation, Department of Corrections, NYC Commission on Human Rights, and the Mayor's Office to combat, to combat domestic violence. We're excited to work alongside these four artists and agencies to bring creative practice to help solve some of our city's most difficult and pressing issues. Last month, we kicked off Building Community Capacity Program in three new neighborhoods, Morrisania in the Bronx, Far Rockaway in Queens, and Bushwick in Brooklyn. We've also started a related effort in East Harlem, building on the arts and culture chapter of the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan. As I've testified in, behalf, uh, in the past, this program provides support to organizations in low-income communities that are engaged in broader planning and development efforts. Through funding and technical assistance, BCC helps to ensure that local cultural groups and artists are represented as neighborhoods <coughs> plan their futures. The previous cohort included East New York, Mott Haven, and Jamaica, Jamaica and Inwood. They concluded the run of their two-year program in January. Affordable Real Estate for Artists, or AREA, uh, Mayor de Blasio first announced the city's commitment to create 500 affordable artist workspace in his 2015 State of the City Address. Create NYC reinforced the importance of cultivating affordable workspace for artists to maintain NYC's creative vitality. Last month, DCLA and the New York City Economic Development Corporation launched an effort to identify new nonprofit partners that are interested in developing or operating affordable artist workspace in city-led development projects. We also released a survey to broadly assess the demand for artist workspace citywide. If you want to learn more about or promote these opportunities among your constitu constituents, I'm happy to connect you with my uh, appropriate staff members. During the cultural plan uh, public engagement, we started the Create NYC office hours with the commissioner. This series provides an opportunity for us to listen to residents about what matters to them in an open, audience-led format. To date, we've had engaging conversations on topics including DIY artist space, arts and disability, immigrant artists, and much more. <clears throat> These events have shaped our understanding of so many critical issues facing residents and cultural community in particular. We've also sparked new collaborations among participants. We promise to continue hosting these events after the plan was released. The next one will take place on March 26th at the Whitney Museum, where we'll be hosting a conversation about sexual harassment in the cultural community. Colleagues from the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and the Commission on Human Rights will join us for this important conversation. More information is available on the DCLA Facebook page. Thanks in particular to our partnership with the Council, Create NYC provided a big boost in funding to individual artists and small organizations in low-income communities. Our largest ever CDF allocation included $6.5 million to support cultural plan objectives, including, as uh, the Chair mentioned, $4 million, to boost, uh, $4 million boost from the City Council to CDF funding, with greater increase um, allocated to smaller organizations. 1.5 from the Mayor to support organizations in neighborhoods identified by the Social Impact for the Arts Project, and another $1 million from Council for individual artists provided for, through the local arts councils. We believe that culture is essential to healthy communities, and we're so proud and grateful for this increased funding. The cultural plan contains over 90 recommendations, including eight immediate actions. Of the eight, I'm glad to say we've achieved substantial progress on all of them, from moving ahead with creating new position in our agency dedicated to promoting greater, greater energy efficiency at cultural institutions, to establishing a cultural cabinet of city agencies to coordinate our drive forward, to drive forward um, cultural efforts across multiple portfolios. Another long-term commitment identified in cult Create NYC and reinforced by the mayor himself at the release of the cultural plan in July is DCLA's effort to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in cultural workforce. Prior to the release of the plan, we directed millions of dollars towards promoting equity and diversity in hiring. This included support for the CUNY Cultural Corps, which provides paid internships at cultural institutions for CUNY, CUNY students, and over $2 million through the Theater Subdistrict Council to fund programs 
aimed at diversifying theater groups. <clears throat> theater as a discipline, as a, a discipline uh, in our 2016 survey, is found to have particularly tough challenges with regard to diversity on their staffs. So we've uh, been excited to see TSC programs unfold and hope to report some of the outcomes in the near future. With the release of the plan, we also committed to building an emphasis on diversity in our agency's funding at every level. To this end, the Cultural Development Fund applications included new questions uh, this year about each applicant's efforts to hire diverse staff and reach diverse audiences. The Cultural Institution Group, given their greater share of the funding, are being required to produce full diversity plans that set benchmarks and increase accountability. These will be due next fiscal year. In the meantime, we've been working with them closely to figure out how to produce plans that translate to concrete improvements toward cultivating more diverse, a more inclusive cultural sector. Another commitment in the cultural plan was to look carefully at how <clears throat> we could support engagement and inclusion of people with disabilities in the arts community as artists, cultural workers, and audience members. To this end, we have created a new position at the agency, Disability Inclusion Associate. We are also planning an announcement about disability-focused funding in the near future. There's an amazing innovative work being done by people um, in the disability community citywide, and we want to be part of making it this more visible, better funded, and more central to the ongoing conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in New York City. This year, we've also implemented far-reaching uh, legislation passed by the City Council and signed by the Mayor, one piece of legislation pertaining to the Percent for Art program, adjusted funding formulas that haven't been updated since Mayor Koch signed them into law in 1982. Thanks to the leadership of Chair Van Bramer and Majority Leader Cumbo, this law went into effect last month, modernizing the formula and providing more funding for individual public art commissions. As the Mayor said when he signed the legislation, the improvement of the Percent for Art program strengthens the city's ability to invest in public works of art and local artists who created it. As of today, there are already 15% projects in the pipeline that will benefit from the new legislation, and the first artist selection panels will take place later uh, this year. In January, Mayor de Blasio released the final report of the Mayoral Commission on City Arts, Monuments, and Markers. As you know, I co-chaired this commission alongside Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation. The commission was charged with developing recommendations on how the city should address monuments and markers on city property that are a subject of significant public debate. While similar issues have long been relevant in New York, the events connected to monuments and other cities place new emphasis on ensuring that our public realm is inclusive and welcoming to all. The commission was comprised of members with expertise in history, art, and antiquities, <clears throat> public art in public space, preservation, and diversity and inclusion. A small number of city agencies with relevant roles uh, and skills provided additional technical and policy expertise. During the public engagement process last fall, New Yorkers spoke up in a variety of ways. Nearly 200 offered verbal testimony. An online survey received more than 3,000 responses. Broadly speaking, the commission laid out a process for evaluating city-owned monuments and markers on city property that are subject of significant public debate. The commission also provided recommendations on four monuments in particular. The mayor largely embraced the commission's recommendations for these four monuments. In general, the commission emphasized additive measures and public dialogue. This includes commissioning new permanent uh, artwork honoring histories of people not currently represented in public property, starting with indigenous peoples, supported by $10 million in DCLA capital funding. The mayor also committed to relocate the statue of J. Marion Sims from its current location at the edge of Central Park to Greenwood Cemetery, where Sims is buried. In addition, the city will take steps to inform the public of the origin of the statue and the historical context. The input from members of the committee, the broader council, and the general public continue to inform our approach to cultivating <coughs> public space that are welcome to all New Yorkers and representative of the rich histories of the city, city's residents. Almost there. No review of the activities the Department of Cultural Affairs would be uh, complete without a nod to one of our most popular programs, Materials for the Arts, which provided a fitting location for the lease of the Create NYC uh, plan in Chair Van Bamer's district last July. This year, we are celebrating four year, 40 years of um, Materials for the Arts. That's hashtag MFTA turns 40. Uh, in each of the last two years, we have pushed very close to the $10 million mark in the value of materials donated to this creative reuse program. We are on our way to reaching this milestone during this fiscal year. 
Along with our partners at the Department of Sanitation and the Department of Education, we are providing free materials to hundreds of organizations and public schools, creating great educational opportunities and diverting tons of useful material from our landfills. We appreciate the opportunity to testify last month at your hearing on the role of cultural organizations in the current political climate. We are proud to support the transformative work our cultural community is doing, and we thank you for your leadership in these issues. I'm happy to answer questions you may have. Thank you very time. much, Commissioner Finkelpearl. You said almost there as if the majority leader and I didn't want to hear your testimony anymore, but I think we both <laughs> Could have sat here for hours and listened to a lot more. So um, thank you very much. No need to rush uh, through your uh, your testimony. It's all really important stuff, and I know that we both enjoy always hearing from uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl. Thank you. Um, a few things that I have. Um, so I mentioned in my my opening the failure to baseline the increases that we have seen, the $15 million is really what I'm talking about. Because we worked together um, very closely to see those gains. And then we worked together very closely in terms of uh, which pieces you would pick up and which pre pieces uh, we would pick up. Um, but all of it is incredibly important and if we are going to do justice to the cultural plan that we worked so hard on and we all talked so much about, not simply being a dusty plan that goes on the shelf, and, uh, but instead actually uh, effectuating the change that, that we all know is needed. <clears throat> and the $15 million is really, for me, that <clears throat> manifestation of of the plan actually changing um, our cultural scene and, and community. So talk to me about the importance <laughs> of the, the, that $15 million in particular and, and what would happen if we did not see that funding restored. So look, I broadly agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, but I, I want to just say, and I hope you don't think I'm pushing back, but I did want to say there's a lot of stuff going on with the cultural plan that it is not within that 15 million. I'll just say that it's the diversity, planning, the energy, the nightlife office. There's a lot of great stuff that came out of the plan that's actually happened. New laws have been passed, nightlife office. I look forward to meeting the woman who's going to run that uh, next week. <clears throat> so um, every commissioner sits here with the oversight uh, committee, and we obviously have goals for our agency. We work closely with our partners with OM, at OMB to create the best, you know, budget for the city. And this is, you know, preliminary. We're sitting in a very similar position that we were sitting last year at preliminary, looking forward to the budget um, outcome. I obviously said in my testimony that the budget outcome last year was was great, that it's the biggest budget in the history of this agency, of th therefore the biggest budget in the history of any city in America, because we have the largest cultural budget. So I would repeat, I guess, what I've said in past testimony, which is that I look forward to working with you. I understand also that there will be push from the cultural community, this is not surprising, to baseline the money, and I look forward to working with you on the budget as it unfolds. I appreciate that. So you get to push back a little bit, and I get to push back a little bit too. Um, because in the, within the 10 million, dollars uh, that the mayor allocated, virtually every dollar in those $10 million was in fact allocated towards very specific initiatives <clears throat> that came out of the cultural plan. Mm -hmm. And so I reiterate mm -hmm. that it is imperative that we uh, once again see those $15 million in the final adopted budget, but we don't even have to get there. The mayor has the ability to baseline that funding between right now and the release of the executive budget, and that should be done, and then we can um, also seek the increases that we all agree are necessary to get us to where we are, because I am very pleased that 
funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs is at an all-time record high. We worked very hard together to make sure that we could say that and you could put that in your testimony and say it today. Um, I am also very proud that the Cultural Development Fund is at a record level. Again, the City Council putting in an additional $4 million last year <coughs> to make that possible. But you are the Mayor's Commissioner yes. of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and uh, it is imperative that the Mayor uh, understand how important this is uh, to you and to the community and to this council and baseline this funding once and for all because we cannot risk it year after year after year um, allow our economy to um, uh, get into one of those downward phases which are inevitable as the ebb and flow of the economy happens and and we all know sitting here today that that 15 million dollars would be among the first that people would propose to take away from our community. And so now is the moment for it to be protected and preserved and enhanced. And I see some happy fingers going you up see the, in the room. Yeah, yes. um, so I, I think it's, you know, of course, a little bit ironic that I used to be the chair of the Cultural Institution Group where John Cavalli is going to testify, I'm sure supporting that. Um, and this sort of definition of what a cut is, so I'm sitting now where Kate Levin was when I was sitting where John Cavelli is. Um, in those days, we were looking at cuts to the cultural budget. They were quite significant, which added up to a big $65 million gap. So the first four years ago, and I, we, we reiterated history here, um, there was a baseline, a big baseline increase, the biggest in the history of the agency, as I understand. Um, to baseline that money. So then when we've successfully been able to add the money, um, the, it's defined as a cut if it's not added again. So it's, that's the position I'm sitting in. I understand what you're saying. I look forward to working with you. I appreciate the collaborative uh, work that we've all done together on behalf of this, and we're going to work together in the coming months. So I understand your situation, um, but it would be good to hear you at least say that baselining this funding is better than not baselining this funding. Increasing funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs is better than not increasing the budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs, and that <coughs> all of the organizations, the nearly 1,000 that rely on this funding, and then all of the, the groups that received additional funding or additional grants as a result of the 10 million that the mayor put in that's really specifically geared towards uh, making sure the cultural plan is a, a living, breathing document. I think it would, be, it would be good to know that you're in there fighting with your uh, deputy mayor uh, and uh, and, and I don't mean fighting against them, but fighting with them uh, to, to make sure that we're getting increases that we need. So I, mean, I can say with great confidence that the money was well spent, that the $15 million was extremely good thing for the cultural community and for the life of New York City. Uh, I can say that every commissioner that comes up here has a role in the budget and that the role at working with our friends uh, at OMB, some of whom are here, uh, to create the best budget for the people of New York City. It has to be a balanced budget. So I can say that um, I am an advocate for arts and culture uh, and that I'm proud of the budget we've been able to collaboratively create and proud can of we, your advocacy. Can we agree that it would be a very bad thing if this lack of baselining led to a $15 million cut to the Department of Cultural Affairs budget? I mean, I think what I can say as commissioner is that adding that money has been a great thing for the cultural life of New York City. You know, I can't get up here and make a comment that says anything that's clear about baselining that money because that's part of the budget process. 
I think we all know the budget process is what it is. Uh, I'm proud of the money that you and I and other advocates and people in this room have added to the budget in, in the last years. Um, when I say you and I, when I say I, I mean the mayor, <laughs> right? That's who added the money, not Tom Finkelpearl. Let's be clear about that. Um, so, I mean, I think that's what I'm, I can say. And I think you understand the limitations on what I can say are, I'm proud of the budgets that have been created. I am 100% certain it's been good for New York City to spend that money, and I look forward to the budget process. And I look forward to the mayor baselining this funding for I understand that. the cultural community, and uh, <clears throat> we've just got to get out of this, this um, annual fight, <clears throat> and, and we've got to you know, affirmatively assert that funding for culture and the arts is critical. It is not um, a luxury, it is not fluff, it is absolutely essential, and mm -hmm. if a budget is a reflection of our values, then we've got to uh, put our money where our mouths are in terms of the value that we place in culture and the arts. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a specific question about the Percent for Art mm -hmm. program and the, the works that you're talking about that are in the pipeline and that will benefit um, from the increase. How, how are you breaking those out by borough, uh, those projects in particular? Because obviously uh, you would not be shocked to learn that I'd be particularly interested in knowing mm -hmm. that uh, all of the boroughs are receiving uh, an equal amount of attention when it comes to the absolute need for public art. Um, so actually, I don't have the borough breakdown, but just to be clear, the law, the, remember when the law was passed, there was a one year, a year from that date uh, was when the numbers are gonna go up, so that just happened last week. So all subsequent percent for our, are based on the new allocation, which is, again, uh, much, more than twice as much money. Um, so the way the Percent for Art program works is not that we seek out, you know, let's do a project in Queens or let's do a project in, um, in the Bronx. We sit down with the agencies and we find out where there are capital projects that are, avail that are eligible for uh, Percent for Art. We look at the most publicly accessible. So I can get back to you with uh, Kendall Henry and our, my Percent for Art director and try to figure out exactly, I'm um, not try to, we can tell you where uh, those works are being commissioned. I, I hear what you're saying, but it's it's uh, pretty obvious that that percent for art eligible projects are happening all yes, over the city. They are, yep, and yep. in every borough, and therefore you do have some ability to determine uh, that there's equity, yes. and and that you aren't just putting them all in one neighborhood, no, no, and I, one I, borough. I, and, and so there is some discretion here when it comes to uh, all the projects because just in my district alone, I could point you to numerous projects that are percent for art eligible. And, and of course, that's probably for just about every district in the city. Yeah, so I mean, there definitely is a, an, an effort to do citywide and it has been true. I believe the percent for art really is a citywide uh, project. It's in all boroughs. But again, I can get back to you and say which ones are at this point going forward, and we can look at that list and see if how it stands. I would appreciate that a great deal. Maybe that's a good topic for another hearing of okay. this committee um, <clears throat> going forward. So <clears throat> Materials for the Arts obviously is a citywide program, but because it is based in my district, we are absolutely thrilled with it. And the $10 million uh, mark in materials, is that also a record? And Okay, so we've, had, we've approached $10 million in the last two years. We're hoping to get to that threshold this year. That would be a record. The last two years have been the highest ever, uh, right around $9.5 million of materials. We also measure it in tons, and they've been the highest. So we are it's been uh, improving its efficiency and reach and amount of money um, saved. So we are hoping for record. The last two years have been the highest we've ever had. Yeah. I can show you those stats also. Right. Uh, share them with you. Um, 
Yeah, that would be uh, terrific. And, and turning to capital uh, with respect to our cultural institutions and organizations, um, I, I think you completely agree with, with me that when we make those investments, we're really investing in the city of New York and the future of the city of New York. And uh, it's absolutely essential that we continue to increase the, the capital program for, for the department and for all of these amazing projects that are going uh, all over the city of New York. Increasing our footprint is, is so incredibly important. So um, talk to me about the capital budget and uh, where we're at now and where we need to be. So <clears throat> the last year, or this fiscal year's capital budget, for the Department of Cultural Affairs was about $175 million. That included a very robust partnership with the council, um, and we're looking forward to that. We're hoping for that really great partnership uh, going forward. We were looking at the statistics, um, and the $175 million mark is a very robust capital budget adjusted for inflation. That's about where uh, it was during the last administration. Um, the last couple of years of Bloomberg were extremely high, but the average years. <clears throat> so we don't have a number yet, and you don't have a number yet on capital, but we're hoping uh, that our investment has been very consistent from the city side, uh, 60 or $70 million a year coming from the administration in terms of capital, similar coming from the council. You know, last year was an extremely good year. The borough presidents threw in maybe $20 million. I can get these statistics exact statistics to you. But it's been a very robust set of uh, investments. We have the capital applications are just coming in. There's a lot to look at. We're beginning to look at that. There's a lot of big requests coming from our brothers and sisters in the audience here today. Um, so look, it's been very robust. I'm glad you brought it up. It's about at least half of what we do is capital in terms of funding. Uh, and we're looking forward no, to another robust year this year. Yes, who here would like more f capital funding? Um, yeah, I think that's... <clears throat> and, and in terms of actually being able to <coughs> spend the money and get those projects built mm -hmm. in timely and efficient ways, obviously there's a lot of concern about the Department of Design and Construction and various issues that some uh, organizations and institutions face. Um, how, uh, talk to us a little bit about all of the capital program, and there's a lot in there, hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. uh, being spent in a way, and those projects being built in a way that um, are efficient for the taxpayers. Um, so first of all, in the way that we spend our capital money, uh, a lot of the larger institutions do either what's called a funding agreement through the Economic Development Corporation or a um, CCG, a uh, Cultural Capital Grant, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, CCG through uh, DDC. So a lot of the money is actually managed by the cultural institutions due to their own capital projects. And that's true only really for the bigger institutions where there's a lot of private fundraising. So. I think that's a very efficient use. That's something that uh, we do a lot of. We've been working very closely with the council uh, to look at efficiencies, to sit down at, with some very lengthy meetings to talk about how the money is spent. Obviously, we are not the capital agency. We are the funding agency. But there's some experiments that have to do with something called pre-scoping, which is to work, especially with small cultural institutions, one of the problems has been that scoping, in other words, to try to figure out how much money you need to do the capital project you need to do, is very hard for small cultural institutions to, to get to the finish line with a budget that's realistic to present to us and to the council to ask for funding, right? So we've all seen this, they don't, you're not quite sure, because it's not you know small cultural institutions, even including something like the Queens Museum where I used to work, didn't have a capital division it had some people who worked on the capital project. So we've been working on some experiments like that, working with uh, pre-scoping with DDC, you know, 
Obviously, this is something we'd like to get done more quickly. So we're working very much on that, but we are not the capital agency. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So the commitment rate uh, is 27.2%. Um, now, there are other agencies that are even significantly lower than that, but there are significant agencies that are significantly higher than yep. that. So what is the plan to increase your commitment rate? Because I uh, also serve on the Transportation uh, Committee, and, and Commissioner Trottenberg has uh, come before the committee in past years, and that commitment rate was, uh, uh, for that agency, was significantly lower. Uh, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg has been very successful in getting that commitment rate up at yep. the DOT, um, and uh, she talked about it just a couple of weeks ago here, uh, right in your very same spot. So for your department and for this community, what is the plan to get that? So there, there are various uh, proposals on the table, not necessarily um, been accepted yet, but I'll just mention two, and I already mentioned the pre-scoping. So we believe that before, if enough research is done, that you really, that the organization has the right exact idea of how to create the scope at the beginning of the process, these are for the smaller organizations who are working with DDC, that that's going to make it much more efficient. So that by the time you actually get the money in hand, you understand the budget, understand the, the scope. And then the other, we've had um, slowdowns in relationship to equipment purchases. So there's a proposal on the table, again, not it's under discussion, but has been openly discussed with the council. I'm not breaking any confidentiality rules. Um, to do alternate year equipment purchase, so that to say every equipment purchase needs to be completed within a certain period of time. It creates a beginning, a middle, and an end. You start over every two years. You only apply every two years. Again, it hasn't been approved. We think that that's something uh, we've been, again, working with um, our friends at OMB about that kind of procurement, mm -hmm. uh, which we think, you know, there's a lot of what we do is equipment purchases, and those things have been taking longer than they should. So those are two proposals on the table. We're absolutely actively pursuing it. Uh, this is something that's been a high priority for the administration. Um, well, I, I may uh, come back and um, ask some more questions, um, but I, I want to wrap up my statement by just saying, once again, Commissioner, I um, am enormously proud of the work that we've done uh, together and to find so many instances in your testimony where you talk about being at record levels of funding. Um, you and I both know more than just about anyone else in the city just how hard we've had to work to be able to say those things. Um, shouldn't have to be that hard, but it sometimes is when it comes to uh, culture and the arts. But we've been able to do it, and we need to do more, and we should see even more increases uh, for this community. And, and then we need baselining. We absolutely need to have uh, this funding baselined, and this community uh, deserves it. And, and we can't leave the community vulnerable uh, to those who have a less, lesser appreciation for this community when times get tough in the city of New York. Um, and I can say on the record that I appreciate your ag advocacy and support. Thank you. I am determined and very, very dogged when it comes <laughs> to the things uh, that I care about. And uh, we just saw our library systems talk about um, uh, their baselining and their increases, yep. and uh, I fight equally hard for both of the things that I care about most in the world, <clears throat> which are libraries and, and the cultural community. So uh, it's, uh, I look forward to the fight again uh, this year, uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl, with you. Okay. Um, and now I believe uh, Majority Leader Crumbo has some questions. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Thank you, Commissioner Finkel Pearl, for being here. Wanted to start off with questions about uh, resources and money out the door and the time frame in which organizations receive funding. So there were a lot of challenges with CASA funding, 
um, SUCASA, as well as the Cultural Immigration Fund um, and organizations receiving those uh, resources. Um, throughout the years, that's always been an issue, but it was particularly an issue last year when many organizations had to front a great deal of money before they got reimbursed. I want this to be the year that it all changes. I want this to be a revolutionary year where people refer back to 2018 and say, that's when they fixed it. What are we gonna do this year to make sure that organizations get the funding in a timely fashion? Because not in theory, in reality, these are supposed to be year-long programs. So what happens <clears throat> with programs like CASA and others is that the, pro the money comes in late, the organizations then start the programs late, the students have already mm -hmm. selected after school programs, and then enrollment in these programs is typically very low because we never got a chance to get the resources out the door in a fashion that would allow it. What are we gonna do differently? Um, so first of all, I will say there's some good news in general. All right. uh, which is that the money actually for CASA, Immigrant Initiative. Um, Sue CASA. And, yeah, no, no, I'm gonna get that oh, okay. in a second. Uh, did go out quicker this year significantly. We had a hearing uh, on that last mm -hmm. year. I said, we will work together. We're gonna do everything we can, promise to get it out. And we did get it out sooner. Last year was, I think, the high watermark on lateness. And it was very difficult to get those council initiative money out the door. This year with uh, Sukasa was delayed for a variety of reasons. Look, the, the thing we would love to do and, and to work together with, with you all on this committee, to work together with the new speaker, to get designations right up front as much as we can at adoption. If we could get the designations from the council early enough, we will work like crazy to get the money out the door as quickly as possible. Again, the results were much, much better this year. I remember last year in December, things were very, very stalled. This year, much of the money, um, much of the designations were completed and things were going out as uh, early, much earlier. So, you know, from our side, we're, you know, hoping and praying that we can get to the point in which we really did make a lot of progress this year. I don't know if the groups feel it, but it really was. Uh, we have the statistics to back up say it was much better this year than last year. But let's make it even much better next year, create a, a system that gets all the designations done in a very timely manner. We'd love to have a very hard deadline, working together with council finance, of you know, the end of the summer for all the designations. We'll work together with you all to, to make that happen. I hear you. I don't see why when we actually vote on the budget, why those allocations can't be included in the budget <laughs> at that time. Uh, and when we vote, those organizations are already part of the decision-making process so that July 1st, we're already um, working towards having that money uh, go into the hands of the organizations. Well, that would be a dream come true. I will say that there's plenty of council members who do make the designations right at the very beginning of the fiscal year. <clears throat> so, and they make designations for tons of things in other areas. Yes. Street cleanup, yep. parks initiatives, all these different uh, types of programmings, those decisions are made. We have to buckle down and make sure that those decisions are made at adoption. Well, to be fair, many council members do many actually do, yeah. make those designations at adoption. We are uh, always working to have more council members make those designations mm -hmm. at adoption and as soon as possible. Uh, I will also say, though, the totality of the issue is not simply about member designation, and there is a piece of this that the Department of Cultural Affairs owns as well. So your point is very well taken, but um, we, we have had many council members designate at adoption, right. but, but some still uh, choose to take a little more time to get that done. But even when they are all done or virtually all done, I think there are still some other issues at the, at the other end, to be fair. Thank you. I also want to move into security. So we're living in another time. Um, going into a cultural institution, particularly a lot of our uh, performing arts venues, 
uh, particularly on a larger scale, are experiencing greater needs for security. What is a DCLA's plan around security for our cultural institutions? Uh, requests that have gone in in terms of increased security um, and allowing organizations the opportunity to not have to have the need to utilize their operating budgets to take on additional security costs that obviously takes away from programming um, and events, staff, utilities, and so on and so forth. What is DCLA's plan as it pertains to security moving forward? So I personally have not gotten an avalanche of requests related specifically to security. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear what you've heard. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of the money that goes to the uh, cultural institution group goes to maintenance and security. So those security guards uh, at institutions, so there's a lot of money being uh, allocated towards security at institutions um, already. So it's not something that has come up as a major issue. I mean, I know you're talking about things mm -hmm. like the security issues at schools, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard from a large number of cultural institutions that there's, you know, but I'd be interested to hear if you have heard that and if cultural organizations do see a huge uptick in the amount of money being spent on security. I just, we, I haven't seen it. We've more so heard from cultural institutions, but I think that many of them that are outside of the CIGs as well don't even think that that's an option for them. So I think that it's a conversation that we have to have in terms of um, how DCLA is going to be looking at security moving forward um, in this new era. Uh, another aspect is in traveling. I'm always very excited when I see uh, brochures, events, and translated into different languages. Where are we with um, allowing organizations or providing resources for organizations to translate materials um, into other languages so that we can capitalize on the amount of tourism that many of our institutions um, enjoy and would like to enjoy more of. So we did allocate some money through the cultural plan specifically for translation services. Mm -hmm. um, that was money that was added essentially to organizations' uh, budgets. And, but we were actually thinking of it you know, more in terms of access for New Yorkers who speak many different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the folks who are going to the tourist destinations, like if you go to you know, big cultural institutions that have lots of tourists there, there's often translation already there for, for some of those languages that tourists are speaking. Mm -hmm. Wanted to go into the diversity work that you're doing. So there's obviously been a huge push in order to make our um, cultural institutions, staffs, boards, et cetera, more diverse. Do you have numbers in terms of where we've been able to move the needle and how that's working and, and what, are the, what are the things that are working? What are the areas where we need to do more as far as diversity uh, throughout our institutions? And have we thought of adding more partners uh, to assisting with that effort, particularly some of our smaller institutions of color um, that could also be considered training grounds uh, for diversifying staff? So we did the initial, when I say we, the, there was an initial survey done uh, by an outside nonprofit, which was um, diversity, equity, inclusion survey of the cultural world in New York City. So everybody who got a grant from us was required to fill out the survey, and it, it uh, created results for 37,000 employees, I think 11,000 board members. The next step, so we don't, that we, we did, that was sort of a baseline survey. The next step is going to be a new uh, survey that's going to be done uh, in the coming months, uh, working with CDP, the Cultural Data Project. And one of the things about surveying is that the, the sort of the gold standard of surveying is self-reporting. And that, that's what this will be involved, and it'll be the CIG plus, plus a sample of program groups. So we, we, since we did the baseline survey, we have not done another survey, so we can't say what the progress is until we do the next survey. But we are very interested in that. Obviously, I think that you know, doing the survey at periodic times to see whether the needle is changing or whether the needle is being moved is important to us. Have you thought about any uh, other ways to include more partners to add to that desire? So, I mean, there, there are... For example, CUNY Cultural Corps. I was just going to ask. Yeah, so that's been, I think, really successful. 
Uh, we have our second cohort. I think it, we've had 200 CUNY students uh, participate. I know many of the organizations out there have had those. You guys, if you've done it, yeah, some of you, yeah. Um, so that's paid internships where it doesn't cost the institution money. We're paying for the uh, internships. And it's a super diverse group of CUNY students. Uh, anybody's uh, eligible who's a CUNY student, but it's just, you know, that's how diverse CUNY is. We've also, you know, worked with their 11 theater programs, theater diversity programs underway with funding from Theater Subdistrict Council. It's an amazing program diversifying workforce at theaters. So there's a series of um, diversity funding that we've been doing, uh, which includes many different partners, not just CUNY, but 11 theater organizations, um, and the entire, you know, sort of cultural field is in, dis in discussion about that. As it pertains to capital, where do you stand in terms of, or where does the department stand in terms of exhibitions being included in your <clears throat> capital budget? Because many organizations are um, different from, let's say, a fine art institution like MoMA. There are institutions that their exhibitions can last five, ten years because it's almost a part of the, the, the construction of the institution, but it needs upkeep, it needs general change and care. Mm -hmm. Many historical centers will be similar to that. Children's museums, exhibitions, spaces such as that. How do you look at and view um, exhibitions in your capital budget? So it's not just us. It, there's something called Directive 10, which has to do with the use of capital money. This Directive 10 is essentially um, a legal definition of what's capitally eligible. So that's something that we work with the Office of Management and Budget on that. Often exhibitions are not ca considered to be capitally eligible. So you know, if you think about it, what happens is people buy bonds, and there's a, peri a, a period of time of that bonds. There has to be a fixed asset that is bought with those bonds. And the fixed asset has to last as long as the bonds, at least, right? So if you're building a building, those are often 30-year bonds. So the people of New York City are paying back those bonds, or the people of whoever buy the bonds. They don't have to be from New York City. But these are, you know, bonds that have a lifespan, and it has to, there's a very strict set of laws around what is capitally eligible. It's not something I, as Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, could simply say, <clears throat> an exhibition is now eligible. We work with our partners at Office of Management and Budget uh, to determine what is capitally eligible. So that, I mean, it's very strict in New York State, and it's been getting stricter. Could a, because exhibitions as well as like certain forms of technology, mm -hmm. it's an extremely difficult space because yes. we're moving into, the, we, we're in the technology era and age and everything is moving in that way, mm -hmm. but the way in which we fund and support um, technology doesn't go along with the bonding process, as you right. would say, nor do exhibitions because people want to see new things, but the construction of an exhibition um, is a costly one and one that often can't be covered by programmatic or expense funding. So what would you say would be the life of an exhibition that DCLA could support? So, I mean, this would have to be very uh, specific. By the way, it's technology. There are different lengths of different bonds, right? So when we're buying for an organization a complete system. It has to be a complete system. It can't just be a computer. Right. But if it's a lighting system or something that's technological, there are, <clears throat> again, restrictions on that. For example, there are restrictions on buying software as opposed to hardware. And I don't want to, I'm actually not the expert. I've seen these get approved or disapproved depending upon the organization. But in general, um, you know, if you, by the way, if you would like to sit down, we can have an in-depth meeting to talk about capital eligibility. That. It is, I'm happy to do it with the actual experts in my capital unit. Absolutely, look, the restrictions are clear. They're defending, you know, those bond buyers and the, the interest of, um, you know, of New York City in creating permanent or long-term assets, right? I just have two more questions. Um, on the federal level, do we have an understanding at this point um, what federal cuts have taken place and how they are impacting New York City cultural institutions or what is forecasted mm -hmm. 
uh, moving forward. So I know Chair Van Bramer had a hearing on that yes. recently and just wanted to reiterate those numbers. Right, so there, there haven't been cuts in arts and cultural funding. So, and that's because partially of advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a national movement. The current proposed federal budget, which was sort of in the same phase, does eliminate entirely agencies, including NEH, NEA, IMLS, and Public Radio, I believe, have been zeroed out. What I've heard from advocates on those fronts is, you know, the really terrible scenario is if these agencies are zeroed out and disbanded. It's much worse than a 10% cut or whatever. We don't want there to be cuts. We think there should be increases. But so far, you know, there haven't been cuts. In fact, there was a slight increase, I think, seem to remember, in NEA funding. A bunch of New York City organizations, I think just a couple of weeks ago, $6 million of funding was announced for New York City organizations from the NEA alone. So there haven't been cuts, and we want to fight against them. And you know, it's been successful in the first. We can't be, you know, we have to be diligent and fight against the cuts happening in the future. Is there a reserve that's been discussed or talked about in the event <coughs> that these proposed wipeouts of agencies happen? Because unfortunately, this president seems to act on what he <coughs> says. Um, no, I mean, so the city does not have reserves in anticipation of the cuts. Our feeling is we should be fighting the cuts. Along Correct. Along with you and along with uh, the people of America uh, to keep cultural funding in place. Mm -hmm. And my, my final question um, pertains to during the cultural <coughs> plan, was there a study or an understanding of what do the cultural institutions um, of the city of New York? So. When we talk about, let's just say, the 28 million for the Cultural Development Fund, the 106 for um, cultural institute groups, and the 6.9 for agency plus capital, do we have an understanding at this time as to what is the city of New York's economic uh, revenue generator for the city <coughs> at this time. So have we done like an analysis to say the city spends this much on culture, either through expense or capital, and as a result, it yields X, Y, and Z? So there have been numerous uh, you know, analyses of the economic impact of arts and culture in New York City. The thing that we've done under this administration is the social impact of the arts study. So that was different. And by the way, we 100% agree with and believe in the idea that there's a big economic impact. But there are other kinds of impact, and we wanted to do that study. So the social impact of the arts study said, aside from economic impact, arts and cultural activities in communities are good for educational outcomes, safety, uh, and other social outcomes, health as well. So it's actually there are correlations between arts and cultural activities, believe it or not, and lower incidence of high blood pressure and diabetes in communities. These are other kinds of outcomes that are extremely important. So that's the um, uh, study that we felt was important to do, the other studies having already been done that we support. So we think that there is an economic impact, but there's also a social impact of the arts. And have you seen that study? I'm happy to share that with you. I would love to see okay, that. Yeah. I, would, I would love to see it on an economic level, <clears throat> educational level, social level, because we would have a greater understanding of how much we should allocate based off of <clears throat> where we're saving just by allocating resources in those areas. So if we find that culture in an area um, brings down crime, then we know that that's mm. a better way of spending money than maybe putting in an entire police force to do that same type of work. Okay, so, so, I mean, just, it's different, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. So just to be clear, um, just a little bit technical, there's a correlation between arts and cultural activity and lower crime. It doesn't mean it's a direct relation. I understand. This study is saying it's part of a healthy community. So I'm happy to share that study with you. And then th this is my last one. Um, we discussed a lot in regards to this. And in my district, the 35th district, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, parts of bed -Stuy, it's something that I'm so frustrated by that there's so much development happening. There's so many corporations, Apple, Whole Foods, Target, H&M, all of these different corporations that are thriving in my district, whereas like a Target's number one selling store is in my district. Um, and they just opened up a second one, number two. 
but the not-for-profit and cultural community is simply not benefiting um, from the philanthropy that could be garnered from either the development or the corporations that are moving into our city. How can we leverage this investment into our not-for-profit community because I just feel like I'm gonna scream the next ad that I see that says, move into the cultural community in downtown Brooklyn, near the subway, near this, and all of this, but there's no investment in all that they're advertising, and it's actually going to, in many ways, not allow those very institutions and artists and, and organizations to thrive in the same way. And I know we've had this discussion yeah, a lot, yeah. and I brought it up a lot during the cultural plan. So I will say that um, I don't know if there is a comprehensive answer to exactly the question you're saying, which is quite broad. But I will say that actually inspired by some of the things you said at some of the meetings, we have been meeting with a group of uh, corporations and corporate philanthropies to understand how they can better uh, invest in communities where they're doing business. So I don't want to, you know, maybe we could talk offline. Uh, it, it, we have taken that seriously. We have had some meetings uh, inspired by that very set of issues you're bringing up. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just want to let everyone know we have the room only until 2 o'clock because we have another important hearing coming. What's that? Yep. No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Um, <laughs> Uh, Commissioner, I want to thank you for your testimony. We have another 15 or so people who would like to testify, so we're going to um, uh, try and move a little bit more right. swiftly uh, going forward. And, uh, but I want to thank you for your testimony. I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank you in advance for your advocacy to baseline the funding and to increase the funding for your department and for this community because we both know that you and I agree that our city is better off when this funding is there and it's there permanently and it's increased and, and New York City is thriving because these folks make it thrive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now, we will hear our first panel, John Calvelli representing the Cultural Institutions Group, Christopher Carroll representing Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians. We have Sheila Lewandowski representing the Chocolate Factory. And I know that we have a, a young man from the library, a portion of our, our panel who's been waiting for hours. Would you like to testify now? Yes, so we're gonna hear from Yosinex. Uh, Orango, that is a great name, so why don't you join us, and if it's okay with our cultural folks, we're going to allow uh, Yosinex to uh, close out our library portion uh, with some heartfelt testimony, I'm sure, about libraries, and um, have a seat, Yosinex, next to uh, Sheila and Chris and uh, John. So we've been at this since 9.30 this morning, and uh, we are... Uh, in hour four or something like this, but uh, it's, it's great to see everyone here. So we are gonna go to uh, uh, a three minute timer. I'll ask everyone to be as succinct as possible. I'll be a little bit more aggressive than I usually am in, uh, in uh, pushing us through just because we uh, wanna hear from everybody who has come to City Hall today and we want uh, to make sure that we also uh, give over the room uh, to the next committee who would like to have their hearing. So uh, to close out the library portion of the uh, day, why don't we hear from Mr. Arango first. Good afternoon, members oh, why don't you press the little light in front of you. Ah, got it. All right. Good afternoon, members of the Cultural Affairs and Library Committees. I would like to begin by thanking you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you today. My name is Yosinex Arango and I'm the young adult librarian at Brooklyn Public Library's Stone Avenue branch in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is also the area where I reside. Um, in two months, I'll be celebrating my one year anniversary with BPL. As a young adult librarian, I provide programs and services primarily to teens. Some of my programs include Japanese language instruction, STEM activities such as game design and robotics, and recreational programs including board games and video games. Growing up in Brownsville myself and sharing similar interests in technologies and all things Japanese with, with our teens who are, reside in our community has allowed me to make, a, make our branch a desirable place to be for our youth. The library is an important pillar of our community, 
especially in an area like Brownsville, which has many low-income households. It provides a safe environment for individuals of all ages and backgrounds to take part in. We help bridge the digital divide in our community by providing access to des desktop computers, laptops, tablets, and of course, Wi-Fi. Our library provides many services beyond books and library cards. We are actively involved in recreational programs for adults with special needs, provide computer lessons for seniors, and are a go-to place for people seeking employment, housing, and task resources. On a weekly basis, I assist adults of all ages who are trying to pursue a high school equivalency diploma. And it's become my favorite question to answer every week because often those patrons leave with a smile. It gives them hope it, to broaden their career options. Um, I'd like to personally thank you all for the support that the libraries have received from you. It really goes a long way towards serving our community. And I'd like to re request that you continue to provide financial support to all three library systems in New York City to better serve our dense population. Additionally, I would like to ask for this financial support to be increased further for the upcoming fiscal year so that our resources can re continue to remain up to date in our ever-evolving society. Thank you once again for taking the time to listen to my testimony. Thank you so much for <laughs> being here. And um, uh, thank you also for doing it in about two minutes' time. I timed it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Brooklyn Public Library always does such a great job of, of having uh, staff and library workers come and testify. And it's always so powerful. And, and, and customers as well. So thank you for, uh, for your passion for libraries and for sharing that story. And, uh, and I, I love my committee for so many reasons, but one of them is that sort of my two worlds collide. And so you have all these great big cultural leaders and they're, they're listening to your testimony on libraries. And you know we're all sort of one big family, right? Looking to make sure really good things happen uh, for the people who need them in so many ways. And, uh, so thank you for being here and for testifying and for your love of libraries. And I want one of those shirts, by the way. I haven't said that today yet, but <laughs> I totally need to score one of those shirts. Um, <laughs> so you're welcome to, um, to stay and listen to uh, all of these uh, august cultural icons in the city of New York um, speak about culture and the arts. Uh, but if you need to get back to... Uh, to work or uh, um, need to take off. I'll take that shirt, Matt. I'll take that shirt. You can bring it up to me. Um, I'll stay. I'll stay. I just feel so like, bright and just like. Wow. How cool is that? See that? And it's a small. That's awesome. Thank you. I will wear that to the gym. Absolutely. Um, so thank you. And I'll. Uh, Leave it up to the cultural team to decide which order you're going to speak in. We'll, we'll go. In, I guess we'll go in this order from right to left. If that's Great. okay. Ex exactly. The best for last. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the committee, Council Member Cumbo. I'm John Calvelli, the Executive Vice President for Public Affairs at the Wildlife Conservation Society, and I'm honored to serve as the chair of the Cultural Institutions Group and co-chair of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Can I ask my colleagues from the CIGs just to kind of give a little hand so that we don't have shirts, but we've got people here, so that's good. Maybe next year we'll have shirts, too. We'll do that, too. Dude, you need shirts. You need shirts. You need shirts. I'm, tr Daisy Rodriguez, where are you? Did yeah. you hear that? We need shirts. It's not real if you don't have shirts and buttons. Exactly. You know <laughs> Let me begin by stating how grateful we are for the Council's vital support for culture and the arts in New York City throughout the years. Your support yields a monumental return on investment for all New Yorkers, regardless of age, background, or status. And I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl for his leadership. And as a former chair of the CIG, I think he understands the complexities of, uh, of the roles and responsibilities that our institutions have. I also want to acknowledge our non-CIG colleagues with whom we have worked alongside several years to increase our resources for culture and arts. Andrea Louis is here, my fellow co-chair of the New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, and I think you're going to be hearing from Lucy Sexton, our, executive, our new executive director. But of course, to my right, you'll be hearing uh, soon from our, the head of the Chocolate Factory Theater. And um, I just want to let you know that we are all working collaboratively to make sure that we work as a community, not just as CIGs or program groups. We are one cultural community needing to work together. This sector is a unique ecosystem that is vibrant 
creates a healthy network for communities as well as engages and inspires all New Yorkers, including the 63 million visitors that take part in various aspects of CIG offerings each year. When I became chair of the CIG, one of my immediate actions was to visit each borough and meet with each CIG to familiarize myself with the needs of the organizations and the challenges they face. Each CIG inherently is aware of their responsibilities to serve the people of New York and integrate the communities in which they live and work. They are fully aware that they provide safe places for youth and families, serve as examples of accessibility, and remain the go-to organizations that the city calls upon to pilot programs like Plan NYC and IDNYC, which I believe have been major successes. While we are aware of the services we provide and the cultural plan affirms the necessity of our work, we still need to continue making the argument for support. And I thank you so much today to the chairman and to Council Member Cumbo for the leading that charge. I love the words determined and dogged. I'm going to remember that. Mm -hmm. Due to the historical relationship that we share with the city, we are expected to meet certain standards and are restricted by others, such as, for example, limitations on raising our admissions prices. We, we need approval from the city of New York. May I, at some point, I do have something for you that I'd like to give you, um, and you're going to laugh when I give it to you, but... As long as it's worth less than $50. It's less than five. Um, these are uh, Roach Socks. One of the projects that we worked on this year to raise money was we named, uh, you could name a roach for uh, a loved one on Valentine's Day. So this is one of the things... Can it's I not, see that? It's I, not a shirt. I was going to say I wanted one, too, yeah. until I... Yes. <laughs> Please, one for everybody, even for staff. As a former <laughs> staffer, make sure you get one, too. I, I will tell you that um, my time is up, but I wanted to share with each of you. Yes, these are the lengths that we go to, Mr. Chairman. Wow. Name a roach. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> um. And I just want to say you're welcome. <laughs> uh, let me so just... Let me just uh, go to the punchline. We are obviously very much in support of baseline the $10 million. Um, we look at, um, we're requesting a $30 million increase in the DCLA budget, again, evenly split between the uh, program groups and CIG. We feel it's important um, that we make a down payment to the cultural plan. There's a great deal more that needs to be done. This is just the beginning. Enjoy the socks. Thank you. Um, so. First, uh, a, uh, I have a pretty good sock game, by the way. I have a pretty good sock game, but mostly it's because my husband buys the socks, and um, I just wear his. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this home and see what he thinks about it. We're here uh, for you. And uh, see if we both wear it at various times. Um, and now, seriously, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, obviously, the Culture Institutions Group members are vital to the success of the City of New York. Uh, literally, New York wouldn't be the city that it is if we didn't have uh, uh, the SIGs doing the work that they do. So I'm grateful also that you're partnering with the program groups um, who are equally important uh, to the effort and to the city's efforts. And, uh, and so I agree that we need to baseline the funding, uh, and then we need to go for the $30 million and. Uh, uh, believe very much in that happening. And uh, thank you to Commissioner Finkel Pearl for continuing to stay and, and hear the testimony, uh, both of the libraries and of the culturals. Um, and thank you for your love of libraries, uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl, as well. Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chairman Bramer, thank you for the opportunity to be testifying here today. And uh, the entire city council has been very supportive of the arts over the years, and we're very appreciative of that. And it needs to be acknowledged as often as possible. Um, my name is Christopher Carroll. I'm the chief of staff for the Associated Musicians of Greater New York, Local 802. Um, and we are here because we believe the city uh, budget should be expanded $30 million and that $10 million should be baseline. Um, you know, I. I want to be the first to say that, you know, as the largest local union professional musicians in the world, we've seen firsthand how the arts and music can have a profound economic impact in the city. Um, but it, we also need to acknowledge that uh, the role that the arts play in our social and cultural health, uh, that our neighborhoods, our districts, our boroughs cannot be overstated. Um, in their social impact for the arts project, um, researchers from the University of Pennsylvania School um, 
Right, that the critical resource that people use as part of that quest for life or value are the arts. Uh, the arts can provide tools for making a sense of the world. The arts can provide opportunities to develop one's abilities to forge connections with people like themselves and not like themselves. Additionally, the team from UPenn found that controlling for a community's economic well-being, race, and ethnicity, we could actually statistically uh, find relationships between the cultural asset index and their indexes for health, personal security, school effectiveness. Obviously, the arts have a profound impact on our communities and our city. Um, I think it also needs to be said that the city has an incredible arts agenda and a sense of priorities. That agenda was expanded upon uh, in a great deal in the Create NYC project. Um, that Create NYC project is our first cultural, comprehensive cultural plan, and it laid out an impressive set of priorities uh, and an impressive agenda for the city to be taking moving forward along with the city council. And thank you for your work on, on that plan. Um, these priorities included, and I'll start actually quoting from the plan itself, determining how to provide sufficient compensation to artists and cultural workers, uh, and what that compensation levels are needed to allow artists to make a living, preserving and developing long-term affordable work spaces for the cultural community to advance the area initiative, increasing the development of affordable, accessible housing for artists that allows them to thrive, creating new supports for arts and cultural organizations with a primary mission of serving historically underrepresented or underserved communities, and continuing to invest in city-owned cultural assets and the community uh, institutions groups. All of these things are great, great work that need to be done, but they also need to be supported adequately by the city. And to do that, we really need to make sure that the city has all the tools at its tool belt, including the funding that it needs to move forward. So, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for all the work that you do on behalf of your members, and obviously uh, uh, we'd be nowhere without uh, all of the talent that you represent. And uh, you, Chris, and also uh, Tino, you've just been everywhere when it comes to these issues and advocating with us and strengthening our message by having you behind us, so thank you. Thank you for your partnership. And thank you for talking about the cultural plan so much in Create NYC, which uh, obviously uh, Council Member uh, Levin and I are really, really proud of uh, having pushed through and, and made happen in the city of New York. Okay. Sheila. Good afternoon, Chairman Van Bramer and Council Member Cumbo. Thank you both for the opportunity to testify. My name is Sheila Lewandowski. I'm founder, executive director of the Chocolate Factory Theater. Um, I did not, I'm sorry I missed part of your testimony. I was at a Women's History Month breakfast with regents of the state who also, one of them, a single mother, spoke about spending time in museums mm. and in cultural places while her mother worked two jobs. That was what her mother did for them, so they would learn more about different people and themselves and culture. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for missing some of that. I don't have a fully written testimony, but two very important things I brought with me because I think they speak to the future. One is from the portrait of Michelle Obama with the young woman seeing herself and her future because this is our future. Another is a photo I took at MoMA PS1 last week by chance of a young child looking at an experimental artist um, statue. This is our future and this is what culture does. Our libraries are cultural destinations as well and their shelves are filled with culture and poetry and literature. So we need to be fully supporting our libraries. We need to be fully supporting culture throughout the city for all New Yorkers and arts education. One thing I will, I want to, oh, I'm going much faster than I thought I was. That's great. Because I did want to say something that I don't know if it was said about the cultural plan, which is critically important and needs to be supported if DCLA is really going to deliver the service they are promising to give to this city. Um, the monuments is a big deal that is being discussed right now. And that is such an opportunity, but it needs support. We have an opportunity to really create things and redefine things based on all of our people and all the, the history and be honest about it. But that needs that funding and support. So in addition to our unions within our cultures and our libraries, what's on the shelves of the libraries, what's in the zoos and the, and the gardens, we need, to be, we need to be doing more to bring the identity of the city up to reflect all New Yorkers. And that will affect our economy, too. There are lots of studies on economy. I'm glad there's on social impact. So the one other thing I had was about data. Data is only so good when it comes to culture. Because if you look at Department of Health, there's culture in there. 
There's mental health services that are impacted by role playing, by scripts, by performance, by dance. There's senior citizens, the senior shakers at Resettlement House, who they, they are healthier physically and mentally because they're participating in performance and dance on a regular basis. If I looked at every agency of the city, I could pull out what is cultural, but maybe we're not thinking of it as direct data. But if we don't fund it, all of that is going to suffer, and every New Yorker will suffer. So please, baseline, increase the support. It'll impact all of us. Thank you. You got a lot in there in two minutes and 21 seconds, Sheila. Um, uh, so I want to assure you that the monuments question is something that we take very seriously. And in fact, there was a very big an important meeting at uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, with uh, myself and Councilmember Cumbo and Councilmember Lander. And uh, this very topic was the thrust of the conversation. So we are all talking about it. And I know uh, an initial $10 million has been allocated uh, for the creation of new monuments that will hopefully tell a more accurate story of our history. But you're right, there needs to be even more done uh, beyond that. So we're working on it, and, and I expect that we will, we will get there. Um, thank you also uh, for talking about libraries and uh, uh, your support there as well. Uh, so I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today, uh, the panel for being here, uh, for your passion, and we will fight together for what we so rightfully deserve. The next panel I'm going to call is Lucy Sexton, John O'Reilly, Mark Rossier, and Ellen Lashinsky. And I know we, do we still have library folks in the house? Okay, so then the next panel we will go back to uh, uh, the Queen's library team uh, with uh, the Great Shirts and with Joel Ochoa who works at the Great Woodside Library. So big shout out to my Woodside Library over there. Uh, haven't forgotten you, but we are going to go back and forth between culture and libraries. Um, whoever wants to go first. There you go. Hi, my name is Lucy Sexton. I'm pleased to introduce myself as the new executive director of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, the new citywide advocacy organization formed by the merger of New York City Arts Coalition and 1% for Culture. I am no stranger to culture and arts here in New York City. I work as a choreographer and also run the New York Dance and Performance Awards, the Bessies. I know firsthand the profound impact of publicly supported culture in this city. My first dance training was at John Dewey High School in Coney Island. My kids' first dance training was in their kindergarten at PS3 training and dance and art classes that need to be available in every kindergarten across this city. My dance company has used materials for the arts for 35 years for our props and costumes. And I'm currently a Sukasa teaching artist at the Open Center in Chinatown. In my new position at New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts, it's my honor and my passion to work for a city in which every New Yorker has their life transformed by a flourishing and vital culture, regardless of background, borough, or economic status. We will work for sustainable government resources and strong public policy to advance equitable public support for cultural organizations, for artists, and for the cultural workforce in every community. New Yorkers for Culture and Arts seeks to address long-standing patterns of funding that have marginalized cultural organizations serving communities and artists of color thereby limiting the city's ability to fully appreciate and celebrate the value of our rich diversity. Committee Chair Van Bramer, Council Majority Leader Cumbo, members of the committee, we urge you to support culture and arts in the FY19 New York City budget by robustly supporting the Department of Cultural Affairs. We stand with the CIGs in expressing our gratitude for the increases in FY18, particularly the additional support to the borough arts councils and the funding of individual artists the $1 million in utility support to those non-CIG organizations in city properties, and the increase to the Cultural Immigrant Initiative. But the need, as you know, remains great. New Yorkers for Culture and Arts joins our cultural colleagues to request a baseline of the $10 million, which you have so advocated for. Thank you. Uh, an additional $30 million in funding for FY19 to be equally shared by the CIGs and the program groups to support the successful implementation of the city's first ever cultural plan. In particular, 
New Yorkers for Culture and Arts is deeply invested in issues related to equity and lowering the barriers to access to city funding. Finally, you may recall last fall, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts planned a forum for uh, candidates with, uh, for city council speaker. More than 600 New Yorkers RSVP'd to attend, demonstrating the enormous interest and concern that city residents have for culture and arts. Council Member Van Bramer, uh, we at New York for Culture and Arts are grateful for your commitment to that planned forum. And we look forward to working closer with you and the entire city council to ensure that culture and arts can fully thrive in New York in all the neighborhoods. Thank you so much. Welcome aboard. Uh, well done. And uh, we'll go to John next. Good afternoon. My name is John O'Reilly. It's good to see you again, Council Member Van Bramer. And, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I'm here really as sort of a last resort, and I think I'm going to be the odd duck in this proceeding. I'm here to talk about the activities of the Queens Museum, and, and in particular, the politicization of that museum by uh, the former director and by the board, which has tolerated a course of political conduct which is blatantly in violation of the law and antithetical to what I think we want our cultural institutions to be. I referenced in particular a, a well-publicized event about two months ago when the museum canceled uh, the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel, uh, and it was revealed that the museum had used taxpayer resources to fund the book about the divestiture, the BDSM movement, I think it's called, uh, divestiture, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And there was great uproar about that. And uh, the, the board commissioned a, a law firm, paid a lot of money to find out that it had been deceived. But the reality is the board was well aware that the uh, former director was engaging in political activity and tolerated it. On January 20th, 2017, the museum closed its doors in solidarity with those who were protesting the inauguration of Donald Trump as president and in solidarity, in their words, with the J-20 general strike movement. Now, regardless of what you think about Donald Trump being president, the museum should not be using taxpayer resources to engage in those activities. I have communicated repeatedly with the museum about what it's doing about that, what access is it taken, and I get silence. I've, I've communicated with the Department of Investigation of the City of New York about this because this is, it's illegal for the museum to engage in political activities, nothing. So I'm here to ask that this committee consider uh, defunding uh, use of taxpayer resources for the Queens Museum until the board either is replaced or comes to you, or the public hearing is conducted, come to you to see what it's doing about preventing this from happening again. As a matter of fact, notwithstanding my constant protest, you can go on the museum's website today and there's still literature on the website expressing support for the J-20 general strike movement and against Donald Trump as being president. And I suspect there's not too many people in here who uh, uh, believe that Donald or who support Donald Trump's presidency, but nobody, the museum should not be allowed to engage in activity. I don't know if anybody in here remembers when the Brooklyn Museum a number of years ago was doing this kind of thing at the direction of the then mayor, and nobody liked that, and it was stopped. So I appeal to you on behalf of uh, people who uh, I've discussed this with to do something about this, to either call them to account to come in here and say what, what they're doing to stop this and or require that the board quit and get somebody else who will follow the law. Thank you. Wow. Um, so you said a lot there, and I will um, uh, address a few things, John. And obviously, we know each other a little bit right. from uh, uh, your Sunnyside days. So as you know, the, the, the board has taken an action and uh, there have been changes made in the executive leadership at the Queen's Museum. Uh, there was that report uh, done, and I, I believe that the board has uh, required the former executive director, for example, to reimburse the museum for the, the book-related expenses, and uh, the board has also put into effect some, some other changes as a result of some of the the things that they feel went on at the museum that were inappropriate. So uh, as chair of the committee, I certainly have been um, 
kept up to date on all of what has been happening at the Queen's Museum. And, um, and I will say that, you know, the one thing I will say is the, the J20 um, movement and what happened there, I think, is an expression of, of art and, and free speech and freedom of expression. And whether you um, feel very, very strongly about uh, some of Laura's work or some of what happened, and, and look, I was very clear, I disagreed with the decision uh, firmly to not allow uh, Israel to have its 70th anniversary celebration. And I was very clear about that. That was a mistake in my opinion. But the fact that art, art institutions, uh, executives, artists would not engage in political discourse, even very challenging and controversial political discourse, in many ways that's sort of the very definition of art, and, and art is about pushing the envelope, it is about making us uncomfortable mm -hmm. sometimes, and, and it is about uh, taking stands. And, and I certainly hear what you're saying. Uh, uh, I think that um, some things happened there that, that shouldn't have happened, clearly. Uh, the board has responded and made changes, and uh, there may uh, be other changes that take place at the Queen's Museum. Uh, I will say that I think the Queen's Museum is a great institution. I love the Queen's Museum. It was the first museum I ever went to as a kid growing up in Astoria. And uh, I'm sorry that all of this has happened to the museum because it's a great institution with great people who work in it. But it will recover, uh, and the Queen's Museum will be greater than ever. And, and we will have a new leader chosen at the Queen's Museum. And, and we'll continue to support the Queen's Museum because it is, it is a really good institution that does a lot of great work and, and brings a lot of different cultures together in the borough and in the neighborhood that is so incredibly diverse. They do a lot of good work, they'll do a lot of great work. I've, I appreciate you coming and testifying. I appreciate uh, the things that you said. Um, and you know, I, I, I think that uh, you know, we'll continue to move forward okay. at the Queen's Museum. Councilman, I appreciate everything you say, but just one thing. If something could be done to make sure that the cultural institutions don't close their doors, they close their doors so that people like me who wanted to go to the museum that day couldn't go to the museum because of their expression of a political activity. That was wrong. Thank you. I appreciate you coming to testify, John, <laughs> and sharing your thoughts on all of these topics. Next. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Ellen Lazinski. I'm here today on behalf of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is a member of the Cultural Institutions Group. At BAM, we collaborate with neighbor organizations on partnerships and programs. We are a proud founding member of the Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance, a coalition of more than 35 cultural groups organized to work for the best interests of the cultural sector in downtown Brooklyn. And we're committed to bringing world-class artistic programming and community events to our Brooklyn community. At a time of national tumult and change, it is more important than ever for New York City to be a beacon of creativity and culture, and for cultural institutions to work with the city to promote ac equity, access, and diversity in arts and culture. BAM respectfully requests that the city baseline the cultural funding that was allocated in FY18, as well as additional funding this year to be divided equally among the CIGs and the program groups in order to support the work that we will do under the new cultural plan. BAM currently serves its community by addressing many of the priorities of the of the plan. Of particular note is the Fellowships in Stagecraft and Production Program, which BAM launched through a grant from the New York City Theater Subdistrict Sub Council. This program aims to securely place individuals from underrepresented communities on a career path in the stagehand and production management fields. Through intensive training and hands-on work experience, participants are able to establish themselves within a professional network while also helping to increase diversity in the field. The Fellows Program offers a much needed entry point for youth from upper, underrepresented communities such as LGBTQ and low income people, as well as African American, Latinx, and female participants. 
The program teaches them to become freelancer in-house stagehands, a field that traditionally struggles with recruiting a diverse workforce. This kind of rigorous training can lead to, can lead to positions in production management. The program will expand the pool of qualified stagehands in the short term and over time as graduates gain experience, increase diversity in production positions. For example, one cycle one graduate has secured a job as a lighting board operator at the Jerry Orbach Theater, and another has been working as a stage manager at Fifth Floor Theater Company. This is the kind of programming that BAM hopes to expand upon with additional funding. BAM is excited to work with the Department of Cultural Affairs in the city to be a cultural leader. By presenting world-class international performances and programming in the heart of Brooklyn, we are able to have a major cultural and economic impact in our local community. As a large historic institution, we are poised to bring more outstanding programming and services to more neighborhoods and communities, and to help our fellow cultural organizations and local artists build capacity and navigate a changing landscape. We hope that you will consider BAM's history and enormous potential when finalizing the cultural budget and recognize that with your continued and increased support, we are ready to serve our community even beyond what we are currently doing. Thank you to the committee and the city for your ongoing support. Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bremer, for the opportunity to testify at the hearing and advocate for the highest possible level of funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York City Cultural Plan. I'm Mark Rozier, Director of Grants at the New York Foundation for the Arts. NYFA is one of the few organizations in the country to support individual artists in all, at all stages of their careers. We work with artists in every borough and every artistic discipline. We provide unrestricted grants of $7,000 to approximately 75 New York City artists each year, including in the past, Ms. Sexton. Um, we have a website which, among other things, lists over 800 new jobs and opportunities every month. We provide fiscal sponsorship that enabled 700 artists and organizations to raise $4.5 million last year. We provide entrepreneurial training to over 500 artists and administrators annually. And we have myriad programs to serve immigrant artists from nearly 100 countries, including programming in Mandarin and Spanish. We are able to do all of this and more because of the support we receive from the Department of Cultural Affairs. It is not just NIFA. To say the totality of New York's cultural sector is dependent on DCLA is no exaggeration. The value of their support and organization's ability to leverage it for additional funds cannot be overstated. We hope you will consider a baseline increase of $10 million, along with an additional $20 million to be split between the programs group and the CIGs. Additionally, during testimony before this committee regarding the cultural plan, many of us spoke of the need for DCLA to receive separate additional support to ensure the plan is adequately funded so that its laudable goals, particularly regard with, to regard with equity and community-based organizations, are achieved. New York City's arts and cultural communities are thriving and driving jobs, tourism, and increased understandings within and, about, and among the city's diverse communities. The budget of the Department of Cultural Affairs must receive maximum funding to support this growth. Thank you for your steadfast and visionary support of the cultural community and the city we all call home. Thank you very much for all of you for being here today and uh, for your passion for the arts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next panel. Um, so we have like two more panels. Uh, so I want to thank in advance everyone for uh, being so patient and diligent, and I want to um, hear from all of you, although we're up against a tight time frame, so we're going to go to a two-minute time limit on the following two panels. We have the Queen's Library, who has been waiting for hours. Um, we're going to allow uh, uh, that panel to come together, and I believe they're going to uh, possibly even condense their testimony, and then we have a cultural panel uh, as well. So. Um, Whoever's testifying, please come up, uh, jump right into it. Thank you so much for being here. Go ahead. Yep. Press, press, the, button. press the button right in front of you. Got it. OK. Thank Good. you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Joel Ochoa. I am currently a customer service specialist at the Woodside Community Library, and I help customers with the public computers, which is part of my job description. I had also put on an inflatable T-Rex costume as part of our Halloween um, um, carnival. And, um, I had dressed up as a Chinese groom as part of our Chinese Lunar New Year celebration, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, um, and I have pictures to prove it. As a Queen's Library employee, I had many experiences I never expected to have. 
I realized how valuable Queen's Library is to the communities um, it serves. Every day, we provide an inclusive and a safe environment to our customers from all walks of life, including children, seniors, the disabled, and the homeless. Our motto is, Queen's Library is for everyone, and everyone comes to our doors. Our customers have access to free information, programs, and services, regardless of who they are or where they came from. For instance, at the Woodside Community Library, and just like many other libraries across Queens, we provide English classes, computer classes, arts and craft programs, story time, exercise programs, heritage celebrations, and various reading programs, coding classes, homework help, assistance with resume writing, job searching, and the navigation of the internet, and so much more. But honestly, do you know what is most fascinating to me? It is our children, our teens, and tweens coming in at three o'clock in the afternoon through our doors, is smiling and greeting me with a big smile and telling me, I'm curious to find out what program I will be doing next. Or that one customer that comes in the next day and tells me, thank you, I got the job. Hmm. Or the students that come in the next day and that you see that they speak better English because of the classes that they have taken. But I do not only see the positive impact that we have, I realize that we need so much work in order to maintain and keep improving on our programs and services. And that is the reason why I'm here today. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am enormously proud of you. Um, obviously, you represent my library, um, and uh, uh, you do great work, and that was very, very powerful testimony. Thank as well. you. Next. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Van Bergen and the committee members. My name is Bashir Osmani. I'm from Queens. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify at New York City Council's preliminary budget hearing on community libraries. I'm greatly humbled to be here in your presence today. As newcomers, we do not earn enough to cover our living expense, nor do we get decent job because of the language barrier. For decades, the free English learning program have been offered at New York City's three library systems to this community. America is built by the immigrants and peoples come from all over the world, including non-English speaking countries. In America, English is the official first language and therefore it is very important for immigrants to learn English. As we all know, knowledge is the power and the backbone of civilized nation. Language is the key to obtain the knowledge and for expanding educations. America is a great nation to keep our pride we immigrants need to contribute our thoughts, ideas, and create a friendly work environment to talk, to take this country forward. Without effective communications, none of this is possible. The Queen's Library at East Flushing is where I came to know of the free English language program. I was motivated to enroll myself in the intermediate class of ESOL program. They taught me better way of expressing myself through reading and writing. They taught me many valuable things. The ESOL program enlightened me and made me feel like I'm not alone. I felt that I am part of this diverse and multicultural city. In the change my life positively. It changed my life positively in many ways. Now I'm able to contribute my talent and experience at my workplace. Mr. Osmani, I, uh read through the rest of your testimony. I want to thank you. Um, I'm really, really proud of uh, the Queen's Library uh, and proud of it because it makes a difference in so many people's lives just like it has in yours. So uh, I want to thank you for bringing your experience here to us today and, um, and, and allowing us to, to hear your voice. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Ana Diaz, and I am a student at Queen's Library's English for Speakers of Other Languages class. To find a location where I could access free and quality English language class was difficult. I needed a group where I felt accepted and could express myself in a safe and trusted environment. When I discovered that Queen's Library offers free ESOL classes, it was a dream come true. I immediately registered for the class and I'm proud to announce that I am currently enrolled in, in the intermediate ESOL classes at the Briarwood Community Library. 
It's my great pleasure to be a part of the ASOOO group. This is a program with a high level of responsibility and the commit commitment to the participants. I feel privileged to learn English by the highly qualified professionals who teach the class and have such an assertive methodology. Because of Queen's Library and their excellent teachers, um, I am able to give this testimony today. It's very important for more and more people to get this amazing opportunity to learn. People, specifically new immigrants, rely on these free services to interact with a neighbor, find a job, access resources, and more. With every class, I become a more independent and self-reliant individual. I truly believe this program changed lives for the better, and we need to keep providing these similar services. People trust their local library to access crucial services, program, and materials. This is why Queen's Library needs more funding to be able to keep offering classes for newly arrived immigrants, update and improve their international language college collections, renovate their buildings and more. Their programs and services empower individuals and improve lives. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask where uh, uh, you uh, came from and, and how long? I'm from Brazil. From Brazil? Yes. And how long are you in Queens? Two, year, uh, wow. two years, yes. Two years, yes. and you're testifying here at the City Hall. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. What a Thank great you. journey. Uh, no. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, so it's very, very powerful. I know we're, we're late in the hearing and it feels like uh, we're moving quickly, but I want you to know, all of you, um, uh, this is very valuable and meaningful to me and it's meaningful to all of us and it makes me very, very proud of the Queen's Library for the work that they're doing and making a difference in your lives. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, I appreciate it. And next we're gonna hear from Jeffrey Onura, I believe, uh, Stephanie uh, Wiltfort. Um, is Tiffany Bryant still here from the public? Uh, Jamie Burkhart, is Jamie Burkhart still here? Great. And David Johnson is definitely still here. And then is Tiffany Geigel still here? You're the last person, so come and join this panel. We'll just throw the six of you all together and we will um, uh, make it work. And Jeffrey, why don't you start us off? Great. Yes. Great. One more time. My name is Jeffrey O'Mara, and I'm an actor and member of the grassroots organization Fair Wage on Stage, and we're fighting to improve wages for the 19,000 union stage managers and actors who live in all five boroughs. Theater is New York City's biggest tourist attraction. Off-Broadway sells more tickets every year than the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, and Coney Island, and it contributes half a billion dollars to the city's economy. And you're all familiar with the trope of the struggling out-of-work actor, but the truth is we struggle even when we're employed full-time. I'm currently starring in an off-Broadway show on 42nd Street in Times Square. My union negotiated salary is $550 a week after taxes and agent commission. My take-home pay is $380 a week. Uh, by the time I finish this eight-week contract, I'll be $5,000 poorer than when I started. I can't afford to continue working off-Broadway. I can't afford to continue subsidizing these theaters with my savings, and that's a sad truth for most of the actors in this city. Actors are falling behind on rent and bills every time they accept a job uh, from one of these off-Broadway theater companies. We started a movement, Fair Wage on Stage, and created a campaign to pressure our union, Actors' Equity, to demand higher wages in our contract negotiation. But the fact is, a lot of these theater companies are struggling to keep up with the escalating costs of New York City. Uh, meanwhile, the federal tax bill that was just passed is going to devastate these theater companies um, in terms of charitable giving, and also actors personally who, no, who will no longer be able to deduct most of the things that we were used to deducting. Uh, this is where you come in. Because theater is vital to New York City's economy and culture, the artists who make up this community are in crisis and we are asking for your help. We propose a $10 million annual fund dedicated to helping off-Broadway institutions pay us stage managers and actors. 
Any non-for-profit theater company that employs stage managers and actors under a union contract would qualify to apply for a grant from this fund to subsidize their actors' wages. These, gra uh, these grants would fill in the gap between the union-negotiated minimum salary and the necessary weekly gross salary. After surveying our members, we've determined $1,300 a week gross is the magic number we need to make ends meet. After taxes, that's a net of about $813 a week. Um, art belongs to all of us, and we need to make sure that we're all able to participate in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. I'm glad you uh, came to the committee and, and stuck it out. And uh, because you are an accomplished actor, you were able to deliver that testimony in almost exact time. Um, and it's an important issue. Uh, you and your group came to see me in my office, and uh, uh, we need to fight this fight. So I'm really glad you're taking it here to City Hall. Thank you very much. Um, Stephanie, you want to go next? Yes, sure. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wilchport. I'm CEO. Hello, I'm Stephanie Wilchfort. Um, I'm president and CEO of Brooklyn Children's Museum, one of the 33 members of the City Cultural Institutions Group, located in Crown Heights, and we provide uh, early childhood cultural experiences for 275,000 children and caregivers annually, more than half of whom come from Central Brooklyn, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville, Crown Heights, East Flatbush, East New York, and Prospect Lefferts Gardens. Um, and when culture in New York City is strong, or institutions like Brooklyn Children's Museum can think really big about serving our communities and meeting the issues and strategies identified in the cultural plan. And I'm here just to share one example of this um, that speaks to preserving the character of our neighborhoods and ensuring that neighborhood organizations are not pushed out of changing communities. Uh, two years ago, our friends at Brooklyn Public Library shared a challenge they faced at the Brower Park Branch Library, which is just a block and a half from Brooklyn Children's Museum. That library is housed in a leased space. It was built as a low-rise building, and it is in a rapidly developing area. It's a very small library, but one with enormous passion, relevance, and meaning to our neighbors, many of whom fought to see it created in 1963, have volunteered in the library, have raised their children in that space. Um, and like many branches, the Brower Park Library provides free literacy programs, after-school homework help, services to seniors, and critical access to books, media, and information for our community. But because the space is leased, it's insecure. It's subject to the interests of private development. And equally challenging, leased buildings are not eligible for significant capital funding from the city, so this library's systems and infrastructure are deteriorating. At the same time, there is little large-scale space to be leased or purchased at a reasonable price in Crown Heights. Brooklyn Children's Museum, however, is owned by the city, and because the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Department of Design and Construction had the foresight to build our museum with expansion space in 2008, today we can offer our community's public library a permanent home in our building of the same size as its current lease space. And in 2020, the Brower Park branch will move to Brooklyn Children's Museum, and it will be there safely and in perpetuity. That's what support for culture can do. It can fund our communities. It can help our communities. It can nurture our communities. Thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Van Bramer. You've been Im immensely supportive of us. Thank you. Thank you. That is really, really cool. Um, I uh, love the idea of museums housing libraries. And um, obviously, uh, the Queens Museum hopes to do that one day, too. But that's really exciting news. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Hello, I'm Tiffany Bryant from the Public Theater. Thank you, Councilman Bramer, uh, Van Bramer, for holding today's hearing. Um, conceived nearly 60 years ago, it was one of the nation's first nonprofit theaters. The public engages one of the largest and, my, and diverse audience, audiences in New York City. Last year, through all of our programs, we offered more than 1,600 performances and welcomed over 335, sorry, 350,000 people many of whom acquire tickets through our free or low-cost ticket initiatives. When Joe Papp articulated the proposition of free Shakespeare in the park, he began with the idea that just as the city offers free libraries, free access to literature and knowledge, the city should also offer free theater. Since 1962, the Delacorte Theater, a city-owned structure in Central Park, has been home to free Shakespeare in the park. Since then, over five million people have attended performances for free. Each year we welcome over 100,000 attendees, and in 2017 we welcomed audiences from every zip code in New York City. Um, I'm running out of time. The Public Theater is proud to partner with um, the New York Public Library, the Brooklyn Public Library, and Queens Public Library systems as free Shakespeare in the Park to ticket distribution venues and sites for our mobile unit performances. 
Um, we choose branches in neighborhoods identified by New York City's cultural plan as civic cl clusters, neighborhoods in the city um, that are identified as high priority for cultural investment and cross-agency partnerships. Um, let's see. In closing, I'll just say that as a cultural organization, we're dedicated to serving the people, all people. We have the responsibility to serve as broad an audience as possible. We have long recognized that free shakes for in the park is not enough to fully achieve our mission. We're confident, however, that our other programs will be able to get us much closer. Thank you, perfect. Uh, and everyone brought their A-game today with library and cultural uh, testimony. So thank you very much. Obviously, we're big fans of, of you all. Um, should we go to David next? And then we'll, we'll end with the New York City Artists Coalition. Uh, my name is David Johnston. I'm the Executive Director of Exploring the Metropolis. I would like to thank Council Member Van, Jimmy Van Bramer and the Cultural Affairs Committee for the opportunity to testify today. Since 1982, ETM has focused on solving the workspace needs of New York City's performing artists. Currently, we administer the ETM Con Edison Composer Residencies, the Choreographer and Composer Residency in partnership with the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, and the ETM Ridgewood Bushwick Composer Residency. Since 2009, ETM has supported more than 80 composers, choreographers, and performing artists. By mid-2019, ETM will have provided over $1 million worth of no-cost rehearsal space and cash awards to New York City artists. In the past nine years, our artists and residents have gone on to win recognition from the Jerome Foundation, the Kleban Foundation, Guggenheim, Barishnikov Arts Center, Cage Cunningham Award, New Music USA, McDowell Colony, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Chris Cerrone, who was a 2013-14 composer in residence, was named a Pulitzer finalist for Invisible Cities, a work he developed during his ETM residency. Jen Shu developed Song of the Silver Geese with Satoshi Haga while in residence in Jamaica. The recording of this work was named one of the New York Times Best Albums of 2017. Artists at all career stages in New York City need this support. Workspace can be prohibitively expensive, even for those at a more advanced level. Now, last year, we were very happy to receive an increase in Cultural Development Fund awards from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm here today to ask for CDF and CIG funding to be held level, to be baselined at FY18 levels for FY19. I would just like to point out that with the increase in funding last year, for the first time, we were back at the pre-crash funding levels from 2008. It's taken us a decade to get there. We really hope that the FY18 budget is where we build from yep. rather than a one-year peak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really proud we got there. Next. My name is Tiffany Geigo, and I'm here on behalf of Dance NYC. On behalf of more than 1,200 New York City area-based dance makers and companies, the service entity Dance NYC joins New Yorkers for Culture and Arts and colleagues advocates to request the city baseline the $10 million in new funding awarded in fiscal year 2018 and the city award an additional $20 million in funding in fiscal year 2019. The need and opportunity for funding is urgent. This is a moment when our presidential administration is threatening the rights to creativity and free expression, proposing the elimination of our federal cultural agencies and implementing a tax code that acts as a disincentive to charitable giving. New York City's increased investment in culture and the arts now will have both symbolic and tangible significance. It will strengthen the city as a beacon for artists and audiences around the globe and ensure New York artists and cultural groups have the resources they need to advocate to advance arts as a resistance state in Trump's America, the powerful topic of a recent committee hearing. Locally, the increased funding is needed to ensure the Department of Cultural Affairs and our city's arts and cultural institutions are positioned to respond to the pressing recommendations of Create NYC, the city's new cultural plan. For Dance NYC and its constituents, the most urgent four parties are increased grantee volume and funding levels including funding of individual artists as recommended by the Advancing Fiscally Sponsored Artists and Art Projects Report published by Dance NYC with nine fiscal sponsored partners. 
an expanded diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda that expressly adverses disability rights as called for by Dance NYC's disability dance artistry, research and partners such as the Disability Arts NYC Task Force, and immigrant rights as called for by our recent New York City's foreign-born dance workforce demographics report, part of a new immigrant artist initiative we launched the last month. The development, oh, well, for Dance NYC, the cultural plan is a significant monster <laughs> and a launching pad for strength and new advocacy. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, so much. I appreciate it. As you can see, the next hearing is about ready to go. But after four and a half hours, the last person to testify is Jamie Burkhart. Hi, thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Jamie Burkhart. I'm a member of the New York City Artists Coalition and an artist safety advocate. I'm here to support the Department of Cultural Affairs and ask for increased funding to implement the Create NYC Cultural Plan. The Create NYC Office Hours events with Tom Finkelpearl bring together artists, nonprofits, public officials for conversations where vital information is shared, unprecedented connections are formed, and bridges of trust are built between creative communities and the city. These types of office hours are crucial for helping underground artists get access to life-saving safety services and for the city of New York to better understand how artists' lives work. My life as a safety advocate began with the loss of another. My friend Nick Gomez Hall, who was among the 36 artists killed in Oakland's tragic ghost ship fire at the end of 2016. Mm. I committed myself to organizing for safety and the preservation of community-driven spaces. Early on, I attended a Department of Cultural Affairs Create NYC Office Hours event and soon found myself in league with longtime safety experts in the arts. We conducted pre-inspection fire code walkthroughs. We helped artists become Fire Department New York certified fire guards. We organized independently as a coalition to understand issues that impact artists the most and to fight for the safety and preservation of community-driven spaces. The coalition's top priorities are to prevent criminalization of community spaces, get access to support, and stop displacement. Forming a diverse citywide coalition, we engaged the Create NYC process. We called for the repeal of NYC's discriminatory 1926 No Dancing Cabaret Law. We called for the creation of a task force of confidential cultural caseworkers to help community-driven cultural spaces get access to code compliance, safety, and liability help. Versions of these recommendations were included in the Create NYC plan, and we were pleased in 2017 when the mayoral administration joined the city council's work af by after 91 years signing the historic cabaret law repeal and by creating New York City's first ever Office of Nightlife. Thank you. I uh, regret to uh, <laughs> uh, end the testimony as compelling as it was, but I want to thank you for all being here for as long as you have today and for everything you do for arts and culture in the city of New York. And obviously, we have a big fight ahead of us, but we're going to fight it. Uh, we've been doing well. We need to continue the progress. So thank you all very, very much. And with that, we are adjourned.